Hey everyone, and welcome to Starting Personas and Their Meaning, the complete series. In this series, I'll be talking about the lore and importance of each party member's starting persona throughout every single Persona game. Throughout the series, the starting personas of your party hold great meaning to the character and draw parallels to the individual throughout the story. I've always appreciated the thought that went into deciding the best mythological or historical figure that was best suited for the party members you'll be spending the rest of your adventure with. This series aims to explain the importance of these choices. From the humble beginnings of Persona 1, all the way to the massive Persona 5 Royal and Persona 5 Strikers. Each game has a special guest segment discussing their favorite character, so stay tuned. And also, spoilers ahead. Let's get into it. First up, Naoya, the pierced protagonist. His persona is Seimen Kongo, of the Emperor Arcana. Seimen Kongo is a Rakshasa in Hindu lore, as well as a protector deity in Japanese Buddhist lore. Rakshasa are often called cannibals created by Brahma's toes that bring death and disease to the world, as well as being capable of possessing humans to commit these acts. Seimen Kongo, however, turned a new leaf, and where he once brought illness and suffering, he now protects individuals from illness. He's often depicted wielding four unique objects, a Vajra, staff, wheel, and coiled rope. The Vajra represents the wisdom of Buddhism. The staff is a ceremonial tool that is often used in rituals. The wheel represents the Buddhist teachings of the cycle of death and rebirth, and the rope is a tool used to hunt and round up those who would do humanity harm. Specific to Persona, his design is reminiscent of the Cult of Koshin, which is a folk faith in Japan with Taoist origins. Taking aspects of Shinto with Buddhist beliefs, Seimen Kongo is a being representing the fifth day of the monkey on the Chinese calendar, a day thought to be where one would most likely lose their life. To prevent the unfortunate passing of anyone, practitioners were told to gather the scrolls of Sarutahiko and Seimen Kongo in order to hold a ceremony in their honor. A common representation of Seimen Kongo in the homes of practitioners were three monkey carvings covering their eyes, mouth, and ears, representing see no evil, speak no evil, and hear no evil, respectively. Naoya himself is a blank slate, hence why most people know him simply as boy with earring, but on the path to the true ending of the game, a lot can be interpreted. The choices required portray a person who is compassionate in many ways, as he values finding your personal beliefs above running from the truth, yet extremely blunt in his approach. Specifically, when you face your shadow self deep within Alaya Cavern, Naoya doesn't care about anything but his video game. This implies, prior to this adventure, Naoya was an average, self-centered teenager caring about nothing but what to do next in his free time. When faced with the horrible circumstances of the game, however, he does not shy away, and instead becomes a leader his friends can depend on for combat as well as emotional support. Much like Seimen Kongo, he turns a new leaf and refuses to go back to his hubristic life of idly passing time alone and encourages others to find their true self. No one is too late to change their ways and be a force of good in life. No matter what you did in the past, always strive to be better. Seimen Kongo's design is that of a blue humanoid with distinctly animalistic limbs and spiked demonic looking head reminiscent of Rakshasa being depicted as demons. Despite his intimidating appearance, he is gently holding three monkeys with a blindfold, mouth guard, and headphones representing the monkeys of see no evil, speak no evil, and hear no evil. One of my favorite persona designs and a great fit for the first protagonist of the series. Masao Mark Inaba the axe-wielding artist. His persona is Ogun, of the Chariot Arcana. Ogun, of Nigeria's Yoruba lore, was called the God of Iron. In the Yoruba myth, the gods descended from a spider web in the heavens and landed in a forest. There, they created the first humans on Earth. As time went on, the people needed more space, but all the tools they used were made of soft metal and stone, and thus were of little help with their expansion. When the gods descended from heaven, it's said that Ogun was the one among them that cleared a path with his heavenly axe and canine companion, and in his early life he was the king of Ife, a region in Nigeria. When the people of the land were in need, Ogun blessed them with the knowledge of iron he got from the supreme creator's very son, Olorun. Once again, Ogun cleared the path for his people's expansion. Despite all that was said, Ogun was an extremely feared being in the Yoruba religion, as he was just as likely to punish and sometimes outright attack humans than to bless them. Ogun is the god of iron, blacksmiths, and rum making, but is also a god of war and a fierce defender of nature. Even in ancient times, humanity would break the laws of nature, which would incur Ogun's wrath. His time as king was especially enlightening, as he was said to frequently attack his own people and even stabbed himself with a spear just to get away from them, which resulted in him melting into the earth. 
Even after becoming one with nature, when called upon by his followers, he always blesses and protects them. Mark, in Persona, is the first to berate Hidehiko about playing the Persona game. Despite this, Mark is part of the inciting incident that pushes the early game forward in an interesting way. He pushes his friends to play the Persona game to prove Hidehiko wrong and is the character who puts the most importance on Maki Sonomura herself. Mark is a hot-headed young man who carries around an axe, weirdly enough, and is a street artist which lends to his creative side. While he might not be the most intimidating, Mark is definitely ready to protect the people he loves, even if the party upset him from time to time. Ogun's design is what looks like a grey man wearing wrapped brown cloth stuffed with vines and an intricate iron mask. He wields a spear, much like Ogun is said to as well, although it's quite crude. The design is obviously reminiscent of the statues crafted in the region worshipping Ogun as a living, stylized creature. An accurate design, and complementary to the passionate Mark. Also, in the original American Persona release, Mark was an African-American man that spoke in African-American Vernacular English, or AAVE for short. I couldn't really fit it into the script, but it's worth mentioning. Maki Sonomura, the sickly sweetheart. Her persona is Meso, of the Priestess Arcana. Meso, or Matsu, is a Chinese sea goddess known by many names and titles. Originally, she was a shamaness from the Fujian region of China named Lin Monyang, whose life was dated back from 960 to 987. In life, it's said that she was dubbed the Silent Girl on account of her not crying during birth and remaining silent up until the age of four. At age 8, she mastered Confucius' teachings, and at age 11, mastered the principal Buddhist sutras. Around that time, Lin was visited by a Taoist master and was recognized for her Buddha-like nature. The master dropped off a book of lore he was carrying with him for her to study. By the age of 13, she could see into the future thanks to this book, as well as manifest her spirit in different places. If that wasn't incredible enough, Matsu started swimming at the age of 15 and soon excelled so much that she could guide boats back to shore regardless of weather conditions. On one particular night, her father and brother were out fishing when they were caught by a typhoon. Matsu could sense that they were in trouble and entered a trance in order to save them. Her mother, however, mistook her spirit projection for a seizure and woke her up, resulting in the unfortunate death of her brother. Her father would later return home thankful to his daughter, but the loss of her brother weighed heavy on her. It took Matsu three days and nights of searching to find his body. It said that after losing her brother, she vowed celibacy and died, unmarried, in meditation at the Chinese calendar age of 28. To this day, Matsu is deified as a protector of fishermen and goddess of compassion. Maki Sonomura is shown to be a quiet girl who was dealt an unfortunate hand in life. Being so sickly, she spends a lot of time in the hospital, and even more unfortunate for her, she comes into contact with the Deva system. This projects Maki into many different astral forms, representing the different aspects of her life. The Maki the party fights alongside is called the Ideal Maki and represents the persona she desperately wishes to be, but can't. A happy, healthy, capable girl with friends and a body that won't just give out like she's used to. Much like Matsu, the Ideal Maki seems almost too good to be true, and that's because it is. Maki is much more than the happy-go-lucky girl we see during the game. In reality, she is a tapestry of different quirks and flaws, making her one of the most realistic character portrayals in Persona. The choice to portray Maki as an almost flawless woman who is deified in death is beautifully represented in the ideal Maki being almost perfect, at least in the head of the poor sick girl. The choice to represent the real Maki with Pandora beautifully illustrates the Deva system unleashing a Pandora's box level catastrophe into the world from the shattering psyche of one human woman. Matsu's design is fairly standard, being a woman wearing a blue coat with a blue hat. Not very stylized, but in life she was just a woman, so for the first Persona game, it isn't really that bad. In the manga, Matsu wears a blank white mask with a teardrop under the right eye as well, alluding to her lifelong sorrow after the death of her brother. One of the best girls in the series, paired with an equally profound Persona. Kei Nanjo, the ultimate affluent progeny. His Persona is Aizen Myo of the Hierophant Arcana. Aizen Myo, also known as Raga Raja, is a great wisdom king and originally a Hindu deity. When scriptures of him reached China during the Tang Dynasty, his name was translated to Love Stained Wisdom King, and in Japanese, the kanji characters read Aizen Myo. Quite the preamble, but Aizen was a very important figure in both religions, as he is one of many great wisdom kings as said before. Him specifically being an entity that could transform worldly lust into spiritual awakening. He's portrayed with anywhere between two to six limbs. He holds in his hands a bell which calls one to awareness, a vajra, the diamond that cuts through illusions, an unopened lotus flower representing the power of subjugation, 
a bow and arrows, shooting the arrow into the heavens, and the last arm holding that which cannot be seen, only referred to as that. Aizen sits in a full lotus position atop an urn with a fearsome red appearance, the red representing his repressed lust and passion, wild hair representing his rage, and a lion on the top of his head which eats all thoughts and desires. Aizen Myo'o is so full of rage, lust, and passion, it transforms into love for all creation. Kind of like in a video game, when if your score reaches too high, it resets back to zero. Aizen Myo'o is considered the patron of landlords, prostitutes, and the LGBT community, eating all hate, lust, and rage, giving only love. This is going to be tough to tie back to Nanjo, but I'll do my best. K Nanjo is the most level-headed and pragmatic member of the group, for better or for worse. His pragmatism is on full display even in the beginning of the game, where he petitions the player to sacrifice two lives to save many. His feelings spill over, however, when his caretaker and family butler Yamaoka perishes, and potentially for the first time in his life, his emotions get the better of him, culminating in the awakening of his persona, Aizen Myo'o. In his rage and hate, his power awakens to bring positive change to the world. Aizen Myo'o's design has, um, a lot going on, to say the least. Purple leather is draped over his shoulders, and he wears purple gloves that taper off into metallic fingertips. Long black stockings cover legs extending into high-heeled metal boots with what look to be handles at the heels. His head is covered with the same purple leather and embedded with small spikes. He wears a face mask which looks like metal plating falling over his body and the same metal plating falling over his waist. It's interesting to note that his skin is noticeably splotched and looks almost stained. Can't say it's what I would have picked for the character, but definitely interesting to research. Yukino Mayuzumi, the big sis brawler. Her persona is Vesta of the Emperor's Arcana. Her persona and ultimate persona are the same as in Persona 2. Since she has a much larger part in Persona 2, and I've covered her and that game's personas as well, I'll keep this segment shorter. Vesta is the virgin goddess of hearth, chastity, home, family, and sexuality in Roman mythology, with the Greek goddess Hestia as her counterpart. She was the firstborn of the titans Kronos and Rhea, and was eaten by Kronos alongside Jupiter, who was the Roman counterpart of Zeus. Cronus ate his children due to him hearing a prophecy that one day, one of his children would grow up to overthrow and kill him. Only by the good graces of Rhea did Jupiter survive. Later in life, Jupiter fulfilled the prophecy and ushered in the dominion of the Roman gods. There are very few myths involving Vesta, most involving miraculous impregnations by a phallus appearing in the flames of a hearth. It doesn't sound very pleasant. Unlike her other siblings, Vesta chose not to marry, instead devoting herself wholly to the Roman people. It could be her immense devotion to the people that caused her to do this, or the fact that she's often depicted as nothing but a living flame rather than a female goddess. Her followers are referred to as the Vestal Virgins, and one of the very few full-time clergy positions in the Roman Empire. Yukino was a delinquent before being reformed thanks to her caring teacher Seiko Takami. Still with a fiery personality, however, she is well respected by her peers and wise beyond her years thanks to her experience. Many view her as a motherly figure at their high school, and she is oftentimes the voice of reason when absurdity hits the party. While not being a main party member in the Sebek route, during the Snow Queen quest, Yukino's personality shines through, as during the beginning of the game, she sees the teacher she owes so much to, Seiko Takami, possessed by the titular Snow Queen. From that point on, she stops at nothing to save her. Yukino looks intimidating, and is even one of the few party members that starts with a weapon, being throwing knives. But in truth, she is a mature and compassionate woman. The goddess Vesta was considered a warm, motherly figure and yet had no children. She fulfilled herself by serving her peers and all humanity. Fitting that the woman who thaws the wicked Snow Queen has the persona of family and warmth. Vesta's design follows the same design motif as Motsu. That being a simple one-color bodysuit representing her element. In this case, fire. Although in-game she uses a lot more nuclear attacks. She has no legs. Instead, her bottom half tapers off into a wispy pattern, alluding to her being a goddess sometimes seen as a living flame. You could get burned if not handling these two correctly, but both Vesta and Yukino have much love to give. A great persona choice. Hidehiko Brown Uesagi, the laid-back lancer. His persona is Navon, of the Justice Arcana, a being in Irish myth, so that explains why the pronunciation is a bit weird. Navon is one of the trio of sisters that make up the Morrigan, goddess of fate, war, and prophecy in Irish mythology. The three sisters' names were Bavkatha, Maka, and Navon. 
The Morrigan's name means Great Queen or Phantom Queen, and she spurs warriors to do battle, knowing full well the outcome and which warriors are to die. She is one of the Tua de Danann, meaning folk of the goddess Danu, the supreme goddess of the Irish pantheon. Whether in the form of the Phantom Queen herself or any of the three sister incarnations, her presence is said to bring about extreme emotion on the battlefield. Bavkatha, the battle crow, brings out brutal fury not unlike a berserker. Maka was the inspiration of the term Misred Make, meaning the mast of Maka, being the heads of men slaughtered in battle, and Navon specifically bringing out hysterical confusion in combatants. All three aspects of the Morrigan are wives to other gods, and she is inexorably tied to the fate of all mortals, being considered somewhat of a tutelary figure, even though she can wipe out an entire army with just her presence alone. Hidehiko is an odd character to have such a powerful persona at first, but remember, it was him that introduced his friends to the Persona game in the first place. The Goddess of Fate sent her aspect over to Hidehiko to cause some chaos in the world, much like Navon is said to do in her time. Hidehiko himself is an attention seeker, but rarely takes things seriously. Little did he know what fate had in store for him and his friends. The man is usually laid back, but in times of crisis, he knows when to get serious and unleash his surprising prowess with his spear to defend people. Navon's design is that of a humanoid white bird with red wings. The avian woman appears to be wearing plate armor and commands the wind. A wonderful fit for the man who brought so much chaos to him and his classmates. Eriko Eli Kirishima the Bewitching Swordsman. Her persona is Nike of the Judgment Arcana. Nike is the goddess of victory in Greek mythology. Pretty broad domain, I know. Her name literally means victory, and she is the personification of triumph in all aspects, whether it be art, athletics, or war. Her Roman counterpart is named Victoria. For Nike specifically, she is sometimes considered an aspect of the gods Athena and Zeus, rather than her own entity as depictions of Zeus sometimes even have him holding Nike or the concept of victory in the palm of his hands. When the goddess takes on a form of her own, she is a winged being looking incredibly similar to Abrahamic angel designs. A famous story regarding Nike is found in the Nonos Dionysiaca. She is an emissary of Athena who is sent to aid Zeus in his battle against Typhon, the many snake-headed giant. At the end of the war against the Titans, dubbed Titanomachia, a number of the gods had fled Olympus, but Zeus remained and bided his time before the ultimate climax of the war. Nike was the one to spur Zeus into action, describing the destruction of Olympus and the defiling of his daughters should he fail to defeat the monster. Finally, after the speech, Zeus had collected his thunderbolts and along with Nike defeated the wicked Typhon, with Nike protecting Zeus with her shield on many occasions. Wherever Nike was, victory was assured. Eriko at first seems like an elegant lady with typical feminine hobbies and an assured path to success in life. Though some strange things do come up, like how she's played the Persona game before even prior to the events of the game, and her almost encyclopedic-like knowledge of the occult. When meeting her for the first time after the demon outbreak, it's worthy to note her surprise at the party having personas as well. This comment comes after she proclaims the party will have her protection as the goddess of victory. Eriko is a knowledgeable woman, but her curiosity and self-confidence get her in extremely dangerous situations. Despite all this, Eriko is the first person to give potential solutions and reassure the party of their inevitable victory. She is an invaluable asset when going through the Snow Queen quest with her occult knowledge, and when starting the Sebek route, her fearlessness is on full display as she tries to fight monsters before she even awakens to her persona. Nike's design is a pure white-winged angel with a halo. As Eriko describes, the archetypal angel whose presence ensures victory. In the manga, and as she transitioned into Persona 2, Nike took on a more metallic design, possibly to symbolize her immovable resolve no matter the danger and her propensity to shield others. A supremely confident woman matched with the goddess of assured victory. I couldn't have picked a better fit myself. Here we've got Yuga Ayase, the carefree Yaru who isn't afraid to make fun of you to your face. Throughout the plot of Persona 1, if you choose to have her join you, Ayase starts out as a bit of a diamond in the rough, being very blunt, shallow, and just a stereotypical kind of preppy girl. On the surface, Ayase couldn't care less about what was happening in the moment, having instances where she'll flat out mock a dire situation, or just sort of brush off the tragedies around her. However, as you journey along with her, her tune begins to change and it becomes clear that in all honesty, all she wants is to find a guy, get married, and have some kids. Despite her seeming like a party animal, her dream goal is simply to have a normal, prosperous family life. This is reflected in her personas, the first of which being Howry. 
Hauri in Islamic culture are spirits that accompany religiously faithful men when they enter paradise, and are described as pure, beautiful, and eternally youthful. They also insist very heavily in Quranic texts that Hauri have big, wide, beautiful eyes, which... Yeah, that checks out. Looking at her design, Hauri seems to have a sort of ritualistic look to her. She's dressed up with a crimson leafy dress and headpiece, both capturing a sort of flowery aesthetic as flowers are often associated with youth and beauty. A smile is carved into her mask as she commits to this ritual, but past the mask is simply an empty husk. Although she puts up this happy front as though presenting what she wants to be, Hauri seems to embrace her own burning, wielding flames whilst also replicating said flames in her attire. Personas, by definition, are the mask we wear around others, and that's made quite literal with the face Hauri, and by extension Ayase, puts on. This brings us to her second persona, Freyr, who oddly enough is a man. Freyr is the Norse god of fertility, harvest, the weather, peace, sex, and like at least a dozen other things depending on who you ask. Generally speaking though, they're representative of blooming life, and he is also considered the most popular god of the Aesir, that being Norse mythology's pantheon. Even Ayase's persona can't help being the popular kid amongst their peers. When it comes to Freyr's history, a notable tale comes as he spots a fair maiden named Garor, who he immediately falls in love with and sends his page, Skirner, to go and retrieve her for him, as everyone seemingly forbade their love. Skirner, asking to borrow Freyr's sword and horse, eventually finds Garor and asks if she'll marry Freyr. She says no. Skirner then proceeds to threaten and curse Garor repeatedly, basically calling her a concubine on repeat until she eventually gives in and just marries the dude. Only for Garor to eventually give in and do just that- what the hell am I reading? Freyder I guess still didn't have his sword though and ended up murdering some Jotun named Belly with an antler or something, I don't know, this dude's backstory is really weird and kinda messed up. Though the loss of his sword is instrumental in Freyder inevitably getting horrifically murdered by Surtur during Ragnarok. So, the sacrifices we make for love, am I right? As we look at Freyr's design, he's definitely got that antler on hand, as well as a large white cloak. Now, why is he associated with Ayase? I, uh, love? Just her general youth and spirit, I guess, but in all honesty, this might be one of the biggest stretches I've seen made for any persona in the series. Reiji Kido, the Ripped Reaper. His persona is Bress, of the Devil Arcana. Bress was the former king of the Tua de Danin, meaning folk of the goddess Danu, who will be referred to as gods for simplicity's sake. Bress was the son of a Fomorian, a type of evil Irish demonic giant. When the previous king of the gods, Nuada, lost his hand in a battle, they viewed him as imperfect and ousted him from the throne. In an attempt to bridge the gap between the two races, Bress was chosen to be the new king and he was wed to a god by the name of Brigid, daughter of Dagda and goddess of heights figurative heights, and literal heights. Much to the gods' surprise, Bress was an extremely brutal ruler, going so far as to enslave the gods and make them pay tribute to the Fomorians. Ogma, god of literature, was forced to carry firewood, and Dagda, father of Bress's wife Brigid and god of strength, was forced to dig trenches. Possibly the most scathing critique they had of Bress as a king was that when the gods visited him, his knives were never greased and their breaths did not smell of ale. After seven years of ruling, Nuada finally received a hand replacement of flesh and blood. With the help of the other gods, he reclaimed his spot as king and sent Bress into exile. Bress was furious and beseeched his father Elatha, but was told, You have no right to get it by injustice when you could not keep it by justice. His father did point him to Baylor, another Fomorian leader, and together they fought a second great battle. But this time, the gods were prepared, and the Fomorians were defeated without mercy. Before Bress was to be killed at the hands of Lu, god of justice, he pleaded for his life and was spared after agreeing to teach the gods of advanced agriculture. Reiji is a hidden character and he really would prefer to remain hidden. He's only available to the player after meeting specific requirements and they're very easy to mess up, like speaking with his mother and finding him in seemingly random rooms in the school. When you do finally recruit him, he shows off his power by taking down a demon in one strike and only agrees to fight alongside you when Mark brings up that you are going to take down Kandori. Reiji turns out to be the bastard son of Kandori's father, with his mother simply being his mistress. This led the young man to harbor intense feelings of resentment for his lot in life and obsess over revenge. His obsession reached such a degree that while he was sneaking through the Sebek building, he got brought into the alternate world alongside the main group. Unfortunate circumstances at birth can lead anyone to feeling hostility. These feelings can be turned to a group or just one person, though in this case, Kandori is truly an evil man. Strangely enough, Reiji bridges the gap between human and demon in his own style, 
by being one of the few party members that can converse with almost every demon successfully. His responses are incredibly intense and intimidating, but he gets the job done. Bress and Reiji both, due to the circumstances of their birth, lash out at the people around them. And while Bress's story doesn't end very happily, Reiji grows up to be a family man. Bress's design is that of a humanoid wearing a full purple suit of layered plate armor with what looks like faded red cloth wrappings and pants with the same colored sword. A menacing looking design for the most intimidating of party members. Tetsuya Sōwo, the dimension hopping hunk. His persona is Vulcan of the Sun Arcana. Vulcan is the Roman god of fire, volcanoes, deserts, and the forge. He's also strongly associated as the god of male fertility, son of Jupiter and Juno, and wedded to the goddess of beauty, Venus. Vulcanus is given many of the same attributes as the Greek god Hephaestus. Vulcanus is most commonly associated with destructive fire, with his temples being situated a good distance away from civilization, but also venerated for the ability to exploit such destructive energy into beauty. Some of his earliest tales are of him as a child, finding the heat of a fire to sweat silver and gold from rocks. From these minerals, he crafted bracelets, chains, swords, and shields. Power in good hands can lead to a positive force in the world, and was integral to the evolution of mankind. Tatsuya's first choices made as a player character are answering questions of what you will do with the rest of your life. While this question may have seemed innocuous at the time, it conveys the message of the game intently well. Finding a purpose is as, if not more important than power in any form. Joker steals people's wills to dream for the future, but you and your friends are immune. You have the proverbial power of fire within you, and it is your duty to put it to good use, lest you, and potentially many more, be destroyed by it. Luckily, over the span of the game, Tetsuya finds his purpose, and with it, his persona evolves into Apollo, God of the Sun. Poetically, this truly portrays Tetsuya as a force for growth and benefit to the world. What better portrayal of the Sun Arcana is there than the literal God of the Sun, eh? Volcanus' design is strange, but then again, all designs in Persona 2 are. He is a metallic humanoid with flame spouts on his waist and shoulders. Pipes coil around his body, presumably carrying combustible gas with pressure gauges on his chest. Volcanus' design seems the most manufactured of the lot in Persona 2, and it serves the god of the forge very well. Apollo's design is a humanoid in a bright red full body suit connected to a helmet with fire adornments. His gloves stand out specifically as being inlaid with jewels and obviously uniquely forged to call back to his original persona. A perfect progression for the integral character of Persona 2. Maya Amano, the big sister gunslinger. Her persona is Maya, but spelled differently, of the Moon Arcana. Maya is the eldest of the seven daughters of Atlas, the Titan, and Pleione, the Oceanid, known as the Pleiades. Maya was the patron saint of nursing mothers and in Roman myth was strongly related with growth. Physical, spiritual, and mental growth are associated with this goddess, said to be the shyest and most beautiful of her sisters. So beautiful, in fact, she caught the eye of Zeus, and with their union, Hermes was born. Maya, in an archaic Roman prayer, appears as an attribute of Volcanus, in an invocational list of male deities with female counterparts representing their functionality. Maya, being the shyest of the Pleiades, dwelt alone in a cave where she gave birth to Hermes as well as raised the boy Arcus in Callisto's stead, reason being that Callisto was a bear at the time. Uh, we'll get more into that later. She is referred to as the nursing mother as well as the earth on several occasions. Famous ancient Greek author Aeschylus calls the earth mother Gaia Maya. When viewed as a counterpart to Volcanus, Maya in innocent sin as well as eternal punishment makes a lot of sense. Where Tetsuya is younger and more reckless, Maya represents a degree of motherliness and responsibility that the rest of the Persona 2 cast cherish greatly. It would not be too far of a stretch to imply Maya was one of the main points of growth for each other member of the cast. No other character's parents play even a small role in the game. Her attachment to Tetsuya is distinctly unique as it relates to Maya the goddess as they were referred to as counterparts in their functionality. Where Vulcan can be perceived as destructive and powerful as it relates to physical items, Maya is constructive and powerful as it relates to the self. Maya is the rock of each other character, and while she doesn't progress much as a character herself, she provides all the other members of the team an avenue for immense personal growth. Her awakened persona being Artemis is also fitting, as Artemis is depicted as a reclusive, beautiful goddess of fertility in the moon, as well as being siblings with Apollo, Tatsuya's awakened persona. Maya's design is that of a slender woman dressed in pink with red hair. 
Her pink hoodie transitions into spiked back guard, and her sleeves have metallic serrated tile attachments. She's blindfolded by a metallic ring, with most of her face being covered up by it as well as her hair, hearkening back to her shy nature. Artemis' design is a female with huge black gemstones on her, um, lady bits, and head. Most likely the dark monochrome exterior being related to her status as goddess of the moon. Surreal designs, but definitely interesting to look at. Lisa Silverman, the romantic kung fu master. Her persona is Eros of the Lover's Arcana. Eros is the mischievous Greek god of love and desire, with the closest counterpart being Cupid of Roman mythology. Eros' origins vary heavily, but is most commonly known to be the child of Aphrodite and either Zeus, Ares, or Hermes. The gal got around. Eros was the god of passion, but also fertility. Eros' chief associates were longing and desire. Despite being an attendant to Aphrodite and the most famous love god, he is depicted often as a baby with poor archery skills or even blindfolded, resulting in frequent missed shots from his arrows of love. Other depictions of Eros portray him as one of the first primordial gods, child of Chaos or Nyx. This depiction shows him in a very different light, specifically the primeval deity embodying all carnal desires and creative urge of nature. Myths surrounding Eros are frequent, but he's never mentioned by name, as all tales of love involve him, leading to his usage being more symbolic. Either way, there's no doubt that Eros is one of the most important gods, as without him, there would be no creation. Lisa Silverman at first glance has many of the traits that are more symbolic of the god Eros. She holds love and beauty in high regard and wants nothing more than to fit in and be loved by her crush Tatsuya. Since she was a child, the only thing she cared about was receiving reciprocated love from Tatsuya as a means to justify her existence in the land of Japan. Despite her having blonde hair and blue eyes, she still doesn't know how to speak English, which led her to never being able to fit in anywhere she went. It's revealed later in the game that she has dabbled in illicit drugs and compensated dating to cope with the sadness as her emotions and desire overcame her. Her love stayed strong for over 10 years however, and she grew immensely as a person. Lisa's persona awakens into Venus, who is married to Vulcan, Tatsuya's starting persona. While Venus isn't really the ideal partner for reasons stated above, it shows a strength in transforming from the god of desire to the goddess of love and beauty herself. Eros's design is a white fur-lined automaton surrounded by enormous red hearts, including a tiny red heart bow, obviously in reference to Eros's love arrows. Her tiny wings and eyes being obscured are a nice reference to Eros's tendency to miss his shots as well as being depicted as a small cherub. Venus's design is a woman surrounded by ornate shell-looking ornaments, a reference to Venus often being painted within a clamshell or rising from the sea. I wrote a lot for this character. Can you tell she's my favorite in Innocent Sin? I really like her. Ikichi Mishina is the flirtatious lead singer of the band called Gas Chamber. His initial persona is Radamanthus of the Death Arcana. Radamanthus was the son of Zeus in Europa, and in some tellings of the story, he ruled over Crete as king. However, he would eventually be exiled by his own brother Minos after he forcibly took the throne. Radamanthus fled to Boeotia, where he wedded Alcamina, the mother of Heracles. Radamanthus' name means showing stern and inflexible judgment, and in his afterlife, he was made one of the judges of the underworld, along alongside his brother Minus and Iacus. Some of the mythology around Radamanthus is actually shown within Akichi. We're told that Akichi is the boss of Kasugi Yamahai, and he enforces a strict no-smoking rule. This could be a reference to Radamanthus' time as King of Crete, as well as the sternness that he's described to have. When Akichi first summons his persona, he refers to him as Deathbringer, which could be a nod to how Radamanthus would be the one to punish unworthy souls in Tartarus. An underlying theme of Akichi's personas is that they relate to important figures of the underworld. His ultimate persona is Hades, one of the more important figures in Greek mythology. Hades is the eldest son of the titans Kronos and Rhea. After Hades, alongside his brothers Zeus and Poseidon, defeated their father and the other pre-Olympian gods, Hades was granted the underworld, where he ruled over as king. While modern depictions of death associate it with villainy, Hades was far more passive than evil. However, he's still depicted as cold and stern. 
The most famous myth surrounding Hades is the story of when he left the underworld and abducted the goddess of vegetation, Persephone, for marriage. However, this act would cause Persephone's mother, Demeter, to leave Olympus out of protest. Hades was forced to let Persephone go, but not before feeding her a pomegranate seed so that she would be bound to the underworld. A compromise was made to appeal to both sides. Persephone would spend two-thirds of the year with Demeter, and one-third of the year with Hades. This is the reason as to why no vegetation grows during the wintertime. These two personas are a good fit for Akichi since they represent the same meaning of death that his arcana does. It's less so in a physical sense, and more so in a metaphorical one. The death card symbolizes the end of a phase in your life, and the possibilities of obtaining something far more valuable. In Akichi's case, he starts the game as a very narcissistic and self-centered person. However, it's eventually revealed that this is just a facade he uses to hide his insecurities. By the end of the game, he's able to put this mask to rest and finally embrace his true personality. Now that we've cover the general mythology behind Akichi's personas, I want to quickly discuss the designs themselves. Radamanthus is portrayed in an outfit that's inspired by one feature in the music video for the song Too Funky by George Michael. A huge part of Akichi's character design is that he's supposed to represent the visual K movement that swept Japanese musicians back in the early 1980s. This style extends to Radamanthus, whose overall design works well as an extension of that theme. The design of Hades carries on the visual K theming while also referencing the story of Persephone. Hades looks very effeminate, almost as if he's wearing a bride's gown. The heads of Cerberus he holds in his right hand also resembles a bouquet of flowers. Since the story of Hades and Persephone is the most famous one surrounding the figure, I believe that this was an intentional callback. This story is also referenced in one of the Climax Theater quests, when the spirit of a girl named Akari transforms into Persephone, and Akichi remarks that she was good looking. Yukino Mayuzumi, the throwback photographer. Her persona is Vesta of the Empress Arcana. Vesta is the goddess of hearth, home, and domestic life in Roman myth, with the Greek goddess Hestia as her counterpart. She was the firstborn of the titans Kronos and Rhea, and was eaten by Kronos alongside Jupiter, who is the Roman counterpart to Zeus. That whole eating children thing is a story for another time, but long story short, Jupiter set the children free. There are very few myths surrounding Vesta, most involving miraculous impregnations by a phallus appearing in the flames of a hearth. That sounds absolutely horrible. Unlike her other siblings, Vesta chose not to marry, instead devoting herself wholly to the Roman people. It could be her immense devotion for the people, or the fact that she's depicted as being a living flame rather than a female goddess. Yukino shows up alongside Maya in the story and plays a supporting role within. She's a photographer and experienced with the occult and persona usage. Being an original cast member from Persona 1, she guides the new group to comfortable usage of their own personas. After a point in the game, she loses her partner tragically and depending on the choices of the player, one of two outcomes happens. If left alone with a lifeless body of Fuji, she sacrifices herself in an attempt to save another's life and transfer her persona abilities to Jun Kurosu. If encouraged to move on after facing Fuji's death, Yukino will awaken to her persona, Durga the Hindu goddess embodying creative feminine force, existing independent of the universe and everything in it. Vesta and Durga represent the transition in Yukino's life from attachment to others, being guides to the party and apprentice to Fuji, and her eventual forcing towards the ultimate personal decision. For those of you who've played Persona 1, you'll know that she was once a delinquent, reformed by her teacher. She became attached to those around her to an unhealthy degree. Yukino embraces her roots of independence while also carrying the lessons that she learned from the people close to her and is embodied well by both personas. While the persona choice is amazing, the design for Vesta is… weird. Apparently her design is supposed to be a reference to Vesta brand lighters sold for 100 yen in stores. I guess in today's day and age you'd start a hearth with a lighter, but maybe that's a stretch. Durga's design is much more in line with her mythological depictions, with the multiple sets of hands and ornate feminine exterior with a dress inlaid with gemstones. A really nice character arc. Jun Kurosu, the botany badass. His persona is Hermes of the Fortune Arcana. I spoke about Hermes in depth in my Persona 3 episode, but I will still go over the history of him nonetheless. Hermes is the youngest of the Twelve Olympians, and in the Greek epic The Odyssey, Hermes is most commonly known as the Messenger of the Gods. Less commonly known though, he is also a god that gives aid to travelers and guides the dead to the underworld Hades, where he could enter and leave without restriction. Often portrayed as Apollo's counterpart, Hermes was a patron god of music and arts. 
Hermes created the lyre as a gift to Apollo, and Apollo created Hermes' winged serpent staff. They're both gods irrevocably tied to one another, yet serve very different purposes. Giver of fortune and fame, as well as herald of souls, Hermes is also known as a trickster god. Hermes was the god to give Pandora the gift of lies and a dubious character. In Homer's A Hymn to Hermes, he is invoked as a god of many shifts, associated with cunning and thievery, but also a bringer of dreams and a night guardian. His earliest tales are that of the theft of Apollo's immortal cattle, where upon getting caught, the exchange of gifts to make amends took place. Hermes created the lyre, and Apollo gave him the Caduceus, the twin snaked staff. Jun Kurosu first appears to the main cast as the Joker, a mysterious entity who can be contacted to grant wishes. When Joker sees Tatsuya and his friends, he flies into a rage and wishes for nothing more than to punish them for their sin. The burning of Elias Shrine, which he believes to have caused Maya's death. Jun viewed Maya as a true mother figure, as his real mother, Junko Kurosu, was neglectful and is later revealed to have been a member of the evil masked circle. Powers were implanted in Jun, along with the false memories of Maya's death and Tatsuya Suo being the culprit. On the surface, this seems to not have that much to do with Hermes, but in truth, I believe it to be a reference to his god of passage and knight guardian status. Jun was plunged into the hell of Nyarlathotep's making, but he could always return to his friend's light and have the spell broken. Maybe it was Hermes who guided him through the nightmare that was being the Joker. If Jun completes the Aquarius Temple scenario, his persona awakens to Kronos, the god of time dark son that kills its father and wields a scythe of false power. A fitting god for Jun's new mission of killing the evil Nyarlathotep, who is now taking on the form of his deceased father. Hermes's design is a white and black striped humanoid with a golden helmet, boots, and thick plates covering his midsection. He wears the same helmet that's often depicted with Hermes, but with rockets instead of wings. This rocket motif is most likely a reference to Jun Kurosu's favorite book, The Little Prince. The iron cross in the chest and a military helmet are in reference to his involvement with the last battalion Nazi program as well. Kronos' design is what looks like a very rudimentary robot skeleton with fur-lined boots, gloves, and an ascot. His head is a clock, obviously hearkening back to his god of time status, but he wears a winged helmet, often seen with Hermes, and golden wings covering his shoulders and back. A good fit for the twists and turns of Jun's character. With that, Innocent Sin is finished. Now we're moving on to Eternal Punishment. Hope you're ready. Katsuya Soo, the doting detective brother. His persona is Helios of the Justice Arcana. Helios in Greek mythology was the Titan of the Sun. More specifically, the one that drives the Chariot of the Sun. He's often conflated with other gods, such as Apollo, who was originally a god of radiant purity, but became later known as the Sun God. Helios literally is the sun though, and was worshipped as such. Helios is credited with a broad domain, such as being the creator of life, the lord of heavens and the cosmos, and even the god of the sea. He's also said to take the form of 12 animals, representing each hour of the day. Though his domain may not be so vast, the transformation into different animals is interesting, as it is also connected with the 12 signs of the zodiac. Tales of Helios are many, but very short, and not very relevant to Katsuya mostly just following orders from Zeus and seeing everything there is to be seen. He witnessed the kidnapping of Persephone by Hades and Zeus, as well as the adultery of Aphrodite. He just couldn't catch a break being the bearer of bad news for all these gods. Katsuya in Eternal Punishment is a detective, and a fairly talented one at that. His sense of justice is established well early on with his willingness to help Maya, and his personality and heart is developed with his growing friendship with Baofu overlooking his criminal past. He's very strong-willed, but a little naive in things. Eternal Punishment changes his occupation from arson detective to homicide detective, tasked with investigating the Joker killings, and even faced with the insanity of Nyarlathotep's demons, he never loses sight of his goal to stop the killings and bring about peace. It's also later revealed he gave up his dream of being a pastry chef to avenge his father and puts away a sizable amount of his salary to take care of his brother, somewhat like Helios' willingness to put aside his duties to comfort the will of the other gods. His persona awakens to become Hyperion, son of Gaia, who's also Helios and Eos' his father, god of watchfulness and wisdom. This awakening is to exemplify the responsible, father figure-like role he plays to Tatsuya and Lisa, as well as the entire cast of Innocent Sin, and even Eternal Punishment for that matter. Helios' design is a bipedal cat dressed in what looks like classic British high-class attire with a very high collar. The cat motif is in reference to Helios changing into animals depending on the different times of the day, and also a little joke about Katsuya being allergic to cats. 
Hyperion's design is a humanoid dressed in monochrome with splashes of blue, wearing long riding boots with spurs and a helmet bearing the sun motif similar to the one on his chest. Ulala Serizawa, the love-struck drunken master. Her persona is Callisto of the Star Arcana. Callisto was a nymph and daughter of King Lucaeon, who served under the goddess Artemis. In Greek mythology, Zeus became infatuated with Callisto, so he transformed himself into the figure of Artemis to seduce her. I guess Callisto was so sheltered she didn't realize Artemis probably didn't have that kind of, um, anatomy. So she became pregnant with Zeus's child. When Artemis found out about one of her followers breaking their vow of chastity, she kicked Callisto out, where she was promptly found by an enraged Hera. In true wife of Zeus fashion, she lashed out at not Zeus, but Callisto, and right after childbirth, transformed her into a bear. If that wasn't bad enough, Callisto was getting used to being a bear in the forest when her son of all people marked her for his hunting unknowingly. But just when she was about to be killed, she was set among the stars as Ursa Major. Callisto really can't catch a break. Greek and Roman gods really aren't the understanding type. Ulala, early on in the story, is painted to be the less fortunate of the best friend pairing of Maya and herself, in all ways pertaining to stereotypical femininity. She desperately seeks love and affection from male suitors, but ends up getting burned by scammers and intimidates all others. Though Ulala never faces quite the disaster that Callisto does, she's the one that lashes out at Maya in jealousy and spite, though is beaten back and depending on the player's choices can help her move forward in life and awaken to her true persona, Astria. Astria, though sharing a name with many other figures, is most likely the titan goddess of the stars and astrology, a progression from Callisto's ascension into the stars. Much like Callisto, she caught the eye of Zeus, but managed to get away in the form of a quail fleeing in the Aegean Sea, where she drowned and became the island of Delos. Okay, the goddess of stars is actually an island, just don't question it man, it's mythology. Callisto's design is a humanoid woman taken to the extremes of, let's say, passion. She wears full red and white leather tied up with white BDSM rope. She wields a metal-tipped whip and a faceplate with a red high heel driven through it, causing cracking. They really aren't pulling their punches with this one. Hide your kids. Astria's design is more in line with the other astrological gods, with a blue, black, and yellow color scheme, as well as planetoid orbs surrounding her body and head. Ulala may not show it, but she must be a real freak. More power to you. Baofu, the chain-smoking hacker. His persona is Odysseus of the Hanged Man Arcana. You'd be hard pressed to find somebody who hasn't at least heard the name Odysseus, but not everyone knows his exploits. Odysseus was a legendary Greek hero written about in Homer's The Odyssey. General in the Trojan War and descended from the line of Hermes, he was also known as Odysseus the Cunning. Portrayed as a man with great wisdom, eloquence, and courage, he was the one to recapture Troy with the famous wooden horse. Throughout his many adventures though, he does not go without sacrifice. He loses 11 of his 12 ships to cannibalistic Lestragons and reaches the island of the Enchanter Cersei to save some of his men. Some losses were unavoidable though, as when he encounters Sirens and the Cattle of the Sun, he is warned not to plunder for food. His men disobey orders, and the ensuing storm leaves him the sole survivor. Baofu is shown to be a very resourceful man, as he sets up a robust intelligence network in a country that is foreign to him all to take down the man responsible for the death of his assistant. After the attempt on both of their lives, only Baofu remained, awakening to Odysseus in the process. His real name is Kaoru Saga, originally from Taiwan. He is one of the driving forces in guiding Maya and the team as a whole in eternal punishment. Though his motives for joining the team initially were lies, as all he wanted was to kill Yung Pao, the man who killed his assistant and boss of the Taiwanese Mafia, he ends up befriending and protecting the lives of the group on more than one occasion. Baofu awakens to Prometheus, the penultimate provider of knowledge and resource to the people of Greece through providing humans fire, though not without consequence. Being banished to Tartarus along with the rest of his brethren, Odysseus' design is a uniquely eastern take on the Greek legend, with high raised boots and a sarashi-like waist garment. His head is raised to a point and his body is reminiscent of a tengu, though with Baofu's signature sunglasses. Two swords are fastened to his underwear too. Pretty badass. Prometheus' design screams Titan, with segmented what looks like obsidian blocks making up his body and his flesh being a bright orange akin to lava, fitting transformations in knowledge and power. 
Now for the remaining optional characters, the ones you get to choose between for Sumeru TV and the Science Lab, Eriko Kirishima and Kei Nanjo. We'll have these ones done quickly, as they play a small part in the story and will be covered more in depth in the Persona 1 episode proper. But right now, let's start with Eriko Kirishima, the beauty model master fencer. Her persona is Gabriel, as in the Archangel Gabriel, of the Judgment Arcana. Gabriel, meaning God is my strength, is known to be the left hand of God and the embodiment of the Holy Spirit, known most commonly as the angel that foretold of Jesus' birth, as well as the key angel in revealing the Quran to Muhammad and the main messenger for all prophets. Eriko is the most knowledgeable in the game when it comes to the occult and helps immensely in her segment. It's a nice progression from her awakened persona in Persona 1 being Michael, the other archangel described as the right hand of God. Gabriel's design is a green and beige clad android with exhaust pipes covering her body and face. One of the designs showing Gabriel's femininity, as the archangel's gender has come into question throughout the years. And finally, Kei Nanjo, number one affluent progeny. His persona is Aizen Yowo of the Hierophant Arcana. Kei's persona did not change from Persona 1 to 2, so I won't be going over it in this video. You'll have to watch the Persona 1 episode for an analysis on him. First up, Makoto Yuki, the stoic music lover, or the main character. His persona is Orpheus of the Fool Arcana. Orpheus in Greek mythology was a musician, poet, and prophet. He was the son of Ogris and Calliope, but it was Apollo who taught Orpheus the lyre when he was a young man. Orpheus was one of the many Argonauts, playing his lyre to protect his fellows from the temptations of the siren's song. The most famous story of Orpheus is of him and his wife Eurydice having a stroll, when suddenly a satyr appeared and tried to get a little too handsy with Eurydice. She avoided him but ended up falling into a viper's den and was fatally poisoned. Orpheus found her body and with his lyre played a song so emotional that the gods wept. The gods advised him to travel to the underworld to bring his wife back. When Orpheus traveled to the underworld as guided, he met with Hades and his wife Persephone. Pleading with them, he played his mournful tune. Hades and Persephone's hearts were then swayed and allowed him to leave with Eurydice. With one caveat, do not look back before reaching the surface. Orpheus and Eurydice just managed to make it to the surface, when Orpheus looked back, anxious to see if Eurydice was behind him. Though, when he turned back, she disappeared into the underworld forever. Orpheus later died at the hand of Dionysian Maenads for solely venerating Apollo and remaining faithful to his lost love Eurydice. In Persona 3, you must shepherd your friends through Tartarus, a level of Hades, to the top with a mostly unknown power. Though most of his personality is based on the player's own decisions, some immutable character traits are exemplified by him. Polite, well-spoken, and brave, Makoto strides into the dungeons of Tartarus and at the end of his journey, dies protecting what he loves. Orpheus's design is that of a slender robot with segmented limbs. A large red scarf rests upon his shoulders in front of a massive lyre he mastered in his lifetime. Mostly resembles Makoto himself, but an interesting design nonetheless. Yukari Takeba, the sharpshooting daddy's girl. Her persona is Io of the Lover's Arcana. Io was the river god Argus Inachus and sea nymph Milia's daughter. Under the name Calithia, Io was the first priestess of Hera, wife of Zeus. Zeus, being Zeus, fell in love with Io and brought her to a cloud formation he made to hide them. Hera was immediately suspicious and found her husband sitting on a cloud with a young cow. Hera, also being quite a powerful god, saw through Zeus's strange attempts to disguise Io and demanded she receive the cow as a present from him. Hera then assigned Argus, the all-seeing, to guard her from Zeus's less-than-faithful hands. Zeus, feeling pity for her, sent the god Hermes to retrieve Io by lulling Argus to sleep and leaving Greece. After some time, Hera sent out a gadfly to torment Io who traveled across the Ionian Sea to arrive at Egypt. There, Io was found to have returned to her original form and with a son named Epiphus. Io was identified as the Egyptian god Isis, goddess of magic, and Epiphus was Apis, the sacred bull. Yukari at first seems like an average happy and bubbly girl, but underneath the exterior she is immensely lonely. She values bonds with others immensely, but is careful not to be too open so as to not lose anyone, especially after her father's passing. Such loneliness lends itself to lapses in judgment that feed into her anxiety and bitter selfishness. Though Yukari is not perfect, and to many she seems to be a bad person, same as Io, overcomes her trauma and develops true and deep relationships with her family and friends. 
By the end of the game, she almost resembles a completely different person, one true to herself. Io's design is that of a jet black slender woman chained within a metallic bull's head. Her feet and arms are bound, awaiting her rescue and transformation into her super persona, Isis. This design is amazing and truly reflects the Greek roots of the character. Junpei Iori, the ace detective best friend. His persona is Hermes of the Magician Arcana. Hermes was the youngest of the twelve Olympians and was the chosen messenger of the gods in Greek mythology. In the Greek epic The Odyssey, not only is Hermes portrayed as the messenger of the gods, but also the guide and conductor of the dead to Hades. Often seen as Apollo's counterpart, Hermes was the patron of music and arts. Hermes created the lyre as a gift to Apollo, and Apollo created Hermes' winged staff, the same staff often associated with medicine to this day. They were both gods irrevocably tied to one another, yet serve very different purposes. Hermes is the patron god of travelers, commerce, athletics, literature, and gain by any means. Hermes guides those on the path, but his duties are never ending. Because of his gain by any means outlook, he is often regarded as the divine trickster. In Homer's A Hymn to Hermes, it recounts many tales of Hermes' childhood, such as stealing Apollo's cattle, to which he later apologized by offering the lyre to him. Junpei, in many aspects, conveys a childlike behavior. Immature and headstrong, he jumps into new situations with equal parts confidence and ignorance. Despite this, Junpei is thoughtful when his carefree facade is dropped later in the game. Initially, Junpei's reason to join Seas is to be a hero and gain some recognition, though just like Hermes, his role is not as a leader. Hermes' role as messenger between realms is even exemplified by Junpei's love for Chidori, Junpei being the only link between the protagonist's Seas and the seemingly evil Strega, obsessed with death and the end of the world. Junpei is probably the best best bro archetype in Persona, as it even somewhat mirrors Hermes and Apollo, though with Orpheus rather than the true god. Hermes' design is that of a black and gold automaton, with gold segmented plates resembling wings attached to his hands and feet. He wears a gold helmet, also with wings adorning it, the same as the winged cap Hermes is often depicted with in Greek mythology. Hermes is in line with Orpheus' more robotic design, which fits. Mitsuru Kirijo, the original teenage manager. Her persona is Penthesilia, of the Empress Arcana. Penthesilia is the daughter of Ares, Greek god of war, and Otrera, founder of the Amazons. One of many daughters, Penthesilia accidentally killed her sister Hopolita, and as penance for this act, she joined the Trojan War, leading her mother's Amazonians into battle. Well respected for her skill with weapons, bravery, and wisdom, she fought against the Greeks in the tenth and final year of the war. Penthesilia met the great hero Achilles in battle and managed to kill him, only for Achilles to be brought back to life by Zeus and come back to kill her. It's still an impressive feat nonetheless. While Achilles did come back to fight her, it is said that when her helmet fell off, Achilles fell in love with her and promised that after her death, he would return her body unharmed to the Trojans. Mitsuru is calm, confident, skilled, and wise beyond her years. Coming from a family of strict conduct, she's forced into the position that she's in though she does little to fight against it. Mitsuru has an unshakable moral code, and unquestioningly does what she must for the good of the world. That isn't to say that she doesn't have reservations or regrets, as she is only a teenage girl. She leads and fights at the behest of her father and her friends, but unlike Penthesilia, Mitsuru fights for what she believes in rather than penance. The defining character traits of maturity and wisdom are always present, and while she may not show it much, she enjoys combat even as much as Akihiko does. Penthesilia's design is that of a woman wearing an armored corset with a breastplate connected by chains, as well as leggings with white boots. She wields a fencing rapier and longsword in either hand, and her knight's helmet is topped with a crown, signifying her status as the queen of the Amazons. This design doesn't exactly scream Amazonian, but it suits her highborn status and combat prowess well. Next up we have Akihiko Sanada. Almost like a big brother to the team, Akihiko is a skilled fighter. Determined, disciplined, and maybe a little dorky. One of the founding members of the team, Akihiko's early childhood was spent in an orphanage with his sister Miki, as well as fellow team member Shinjiro Aragaki. Following Miki's tragic death and a fire that took the orphanage with it, Akihiko has constantly made an effort to become stronger to keep her memory alive, going to every effort to avoid feeling powerless again. Possessing the Emperor Arcana, Akihiko starts off the game with the persona Polydeuces. 
In Greek and Roman mythology, Polydeuces was one of two warrior twins, with the other being Castor, who also happened to be Shinjiro's persona. Polydeuces was skilled at hunting and horseback riding, and was even involved in the famous story of Jason and the Argonauts, where he defeated the king of a mythical tribe in, you guessed it, a boxing match. Polydeuces and Castor also set off to rescue their sister Helen when she was kidnapped, invading an entire kingdom just to get her back, which lines up with Akihiko's own desire to strengthen himself for the sake of his own sister. Interestingly, while the twins had the same mother, Leta, Polydeuces' father was actually none other than Zeus, making him immortal. The same can't be said for Castor, whose father was a mortal man called Tyndareus. Considering Akihiko survived a battle against death itself, and well, Shinjiro doesn't make it that far, it definitely seems like the developers did their research when picking personas for these guys. Upon Castor's death in mythology, Polydeuces requests to share his immortality with his brother, and the two become the Gemini constellation. Crazy stuff. In the game, after Shinjiro dies, Akihiko struggles for a while, but eventually decides to carry Shinjiro's memory with him and press onwards, awakening to a new persona, Caesar. Now Caesar isn't just a name, it's actually a title that was given to rulers of Imperial Rome. This title, of course, was derived from the famous Emperor Julius Caesar. Caesar just kind of represents sheer power, I mean look, he's holding the world in his hands. At this point, Akihiko is ready for anything, able to take on whatever challenges lie ahead with an iron will. Also, he looks a lot like Emperor Hazuma from Shin Megami Tensei Hit. Just had to throw that one in there. The visual design of both of Akihiko's personas are also pretty interesting. Polydeuces takes on a strange form that's both noble and terrifying. His long flowing hair seems like a typical characteristic of the classic knight in shining armor, but his head is oddly misshapen and stuffed down into the armor. His limbs are even more unusual, starting off as powerful and muscular, and gradually becoming more and more thin, with nearly pointed ends in the case of his legs. Rather than a sword or a bow, Polydeuces has what looks like a screwdriver attached to his arm. To me, what this design says is that Akihiko is still a hero in the making. Like the Greek legend, he's a skilled fighter, but with the muscle and armor comes a covered mouth and oddly soulless looking eyes, perhaps implying that Akihiko has a lot to learn, or that he hasn't awoken to his true feelings for his team yet. Caesar's design is much more refined, majestic, and looks much less clumsy. He has a powerful, unchanging expression, and his sword is held ready to strike. The globe in his hand symbolizes, of course, Rome's immense power over the world at the time, and again, Akihiko's newfound strength. Interestingly, there's a little guy sitting inside of Caesar's chest. This could represent the idea that Caesar is meant to be a depiction of Rome itself, with the man in the center being the ruler that guides it. Or, it could also be that Shinjiro is a guiding force in Akihiko's decision to move forward, kept ever present in his heart. Fuka Yamagishi, the Technophile Navigator. Her persona is Lucia of the Priestess Arcana. Lucia of Syracuse, also known as Saint Lucia, was a Christian martyr who died during the Diocletianatic persecution, which was the last and most severe persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire starting in the year 303. Lucia was a devout young woman who lived her life in alms and consecrated her virginity for God, much to the dismay of her betrothed. Lucia's mother, Eutychia, arranged for her to marry a wealthy pagan, but she refused. Eventually, Eutychia respected Lucia's decision to abstain from the wedding, yet her betrothed was so enraged that he reported her to the Christian magistrates, threatening to have her defiled in a brothel. She was asked to burn a sacrifice to the emperor's image, which she refused, and was faced with execution. As the guards were approaching, Lucia knelt down and prayed for salvation. That salvation came in a strange way as when they tried to move her, she was completely fixed to the ground where she knelt. The guards became so frustrated they tried to violently uproot her, and even went so far as to stab her and light her on fire. Yet even through all this, she remained fixed to her position, venerating God. Christians believe her body to have been filled with the Holy Spirit, performing this miracle. Lucia's betrothed, seeing this, said that if he could not have her beautiful eyes, no one could, and proceeded to gouge out her eyes and slash her throat. Even through so much suffering, she could still see and prophesied an end to the Christian persecution. With one final stab from a guard, Lucia's life came to an end. As she was being prepped for burial, it was discovered that Lucia's eyes had been miraculously restored, more beautiful than they were even in life. Oh my god, now I know why this game has a mature rating. Now, what does this have to do with Fukuyamagishi? Not much really. 
I think they just chose her because she was attributed to heavenly sight and is a good fit for the navigator position. Fuka is an incredibly shy and kind girl, holding no grudges even to her previous bully and always being polite. She shows great zeal in helping seas with their missions. Her actions do convey a certain degree of saintliness, but let's hope she lives a long and happy life. None of that eye gouging and burning. Lucia's design is that of a woman with long flowing hair draped over a pink dress. Lucia's face is blood red with bandages covering her eyes, symbolizing the circumstances of the saint's death, and her lower half is what looks like a glass eye. Fuka awakening to her persona shows her knelt down within the eye, protected from all harm. An elegant and venerable design. I guess the manufactured anti-shadow waifu. Her persona is Palladion of the Chariot Arcana, but Aegis herself is Aeon. In Greek and Roman mythology, the Palladion was a cult image of utmost importance which the safety of Troy and later Rome was said to depend. The image was a wooden statue of Pallas Athena that Odysseus and Diomedes stole from the citadel of Troy and was later taken to the future site of Rome. The Palladion was worshipped as the protectress of the city and called the carving that fell from heaven. Athena is the goddess of wisdom, courage, inspiration, justice, and many more, whose valor aided Heracles and Perseus to many victories. You should understand why the statue would mean so much to the Greeks. Aegis first appears as a cold automaton just following orders, however after some maintenance, her artificial intelligence helps her develop almost human-like emotions. After this, Aegis becomes the pillar of seas, aiding them with wisdom and firepower. What was once an artifact that merely showed the visage of a human like the original Aegis in the Palladion, Aegis awakens into that which she portrays. Aegis becomes a superhuman aid to the journey of seas, as Athena once did to the great heroes of old. Palladion's design is a giant lance attached to what looks like a motor surrounded by armor that's fitted for a woman. A detached face rests underneath the lance that looks to be sleeping. When awakened to Athena, however, the design is completely human-like, depicting a woman in a flowing white robe with the centurion's helmet on, wielding a large spear and ornate shield surrounding her body. The design is stylized, but generally identical to the artistic depictions of Athena. A perfect fit for Agus's character arc. Koromaru, the... dog. His persona is Cerberus, of the Strength Arcana. Cerberus is a giant three-headed dog that guards the gates of Hades. Almost all depictions of Cerberus describe him as a horrific, flesh-eating beast loyally guarding his master Hades' domain. Accounts of Cerberus may also say that he has many more heads, up to 100 in fact, and snakes protruding through his body. Cerberus' main appearance in myth is within the Twelve Labors of Heracles, in which Heracles had to retrieve Cerberus from Hades and present him to Eurystheus. Heracles accomplished this with the help of Athena and Apollo by wrestling the dog into submission with a lion's pelt, upon which Hades agreed to part with Cerberus for a short time. This story though I find to be irrelevant to Koromaru, for obvious reasons. I think Cerberus was chosen as Koromaru's persona for the simple fact that he is a loyal companion to the lord of the underworld, Hades, keeping in line with the Greek myth-inspired personas. Koromaru's personality, however, was based on a real-world dog named Hachiko. Hachiko was a farm dog adopted by Professor Ueno at Tokyo University, who brought him to live in Shibuya with him. Hachiko would meet Ueno at Shibuya Station every day after his commute home. After only a year of companionship, Ueno died of a cerebral hemorrhage while at work on May 21st, 1925. From then until the poor dog's death on March 8th, 1935, Hachiko would return to Shibuya Station every day to wait for Ueno's return. Almost 10 full years of a loyal dog awaiting his master's love. Well after his death though, Hachiko is remembered in culture as a symbol of loyalty. Koromaru has a similar backstory, walking at his master's shrine long after his death, every day. He shows similar loyalty to the members of Seas, as even he fiercely battles the shadows with the strength of character that allows him to wield a persona. Cerberus' design is that of a three-headed black dog with blue underbelly, collared by chains to wings attached to their front legs. Instead of paws, Cerberus has tridents for feet and a long pointed tail possibly symbolizing the snake protrusions on historical accounts. Who knew there would be so much to talk about with a literal dog? Ken Amada, the boy genius. His persona is Nemesis of the Justice Arcana. In Greek mythology, Nemesis was the goddess of vengeance and divine retribution, the daughter of Nyx, goddess of night and shadow. Nemesis is the distributor of fortune, neither good nor bad, simply in due proportion to each according to what they deserve. The act she's most well known for is the punishment of Narcissus. 
Due to Narcissus's immense hubris, he scorned all of his suitors, believing himself to be above them. As punishment, Nemesis lured him to a pool where he gazed upon his own reflection and fell so deeply in love with it that he refused to move and died staring at himself. Her way of doling out justice is more poetic than violent, and is most likely the Greek's version of the belief in karma. Ken Amada, after the death of his mother, was distraught, and with the dismissal of the police, he became consumed with the idea of revenge at a young age. He gave up his childhood in pursuit of the truth behind the incident, so much so that he implies he intended to end his life once he found vengeance. His investigation led him to the truth of Shinjiro Aragaki being the perpetrator. After Ken confronts Shinjiro, he comes to understand the mental turmoil that he was in as well, for a different reason. Once you take a life, there's no going back, and after all your hatred is gone, you only have regret. After their conversation, they're attacked by Strega, and Shinjiro sacrifices himself to protect the innocent Ken's life. With Shinjiro's death, justice is served to both Shinjiro and Ken. Ken grows to be one that appreciates life and lives on with the memory of his mother and Shinjiro in his heart. Poetic justice, for sure. Nemesis' design is a sleek, black, metallic body with a saw blade passing through the top and bottom of the persona. There's a face in the chest of the persona with large red gemstone eyes and a sharp, fanged smile. I don't get the design much, but it looks cool. Also, I couldn't relate it to Ken, but Nemesis is possibly the true mother of Polydeuces and Castor. Pretty cool, huh? Shinjiro Aragaki, the brooding delinquent. His persona is Castor of the Hierophant Arcana. Castor was talked about in the Akihiko section thanks to my buddy Marsh, but I'll talk about him again if you're watching different segments. Castor and Polydeuces were the twin sons of Leda, but had different fathers. Castor was the mortal son of Tyndarius, king of Sparta, while Polydeuces was son of Zeus, king of the gods. Even though Polydeuces was a demigod and Castor was immortal, they were inseparable. Fighting alongside the Argonauts, destroying the city of Lolcus as a revenge for their treachery, and rescuing the pair's sister, Helen, from the city of Attica. They were called the Dioscuri, translating to Sons of Zeus, even though only one of the brothers were. Castor was fatally wounded by one of his two brothers' spears after a, what we'll call a marital dispute. With the last of his strength, he called out to warn his brother. Polydeuces slayed one of the cousins, and Zeus called a thunderbolt to finish off the other, saving his son. After the battle, Polydeuces returned to Castor and begged Zeus to allow him to share his immortality with his brother. His wish was granted, and the pair were carried up to the heavens to become the Gemini constellation. Shinjiro Aragaki was one of the original members of Seas, along with Akihiko and Mitsuru. Though Shinji and Akihiko were not together for a large portion of the game, their bond is stated very clearly. The only reason why Shinji left Akihiko was because his persona went out of control and killed a bystander. That bystander being Kanemata's mother. Shinjiro could never attain full control over his persona like Akihiko did and receded into the shadows after the accident. The only reason he joins back is he's convinced by an injured Akihiko to lend his power to fight the ever-growing threat of shadows. Shinji ultimately meets his end, protecting Ken. Castor was chosen for Shinji's persona as he was the weaker persona user between him and Akihiko. His death even somewhat mirrors Castor's in his final act being the protection of another. Only difference is that he was killed by a bullet, not a spear. Though Ken did try. Castor's design is almost the same as Polydeuces' design, with a black motif rather than white. He's riding a stylized armored horse with a spear tip embedded in his chest, the same manner in Castor's death. When seen together, it really does represent the legendary Dioscuri. First up, the king himself, Yu Narukami. Yu's starting persona is Izanagi of the Fool Arcana. Usually, I do a little summary for the character myself, but I don't think I can top the game in this regard, so I'll be quoting directly from Mr. Edogawa, the Japanese creation myth. The two gods who gave birth to this country are the god Izanagi and the goddess Izanami. They got along very well, but one day Izanami died while giving birth to Kagutsuchi, the fire god. Extremely saddened by this, Izanagi left for the land of the dead to bring back Izanami. Yomi, the dark underworld. There, Izanagi asked Izanami, who had become a dweller of the Land of Shadows, to come back with him to the land above. The goddess replied by saying she would negotiate with the god of the underworld, and asked Izanagi to wait for her. However, Izanagi became curious to know what was going on, so he broke his promise and set his comb alight to have a look around. What he saw was the goddess Izanami whose body was completely covered in filth and maggots. 
Terrified, Izanagi ran away, but the enraged Izanami chased after him. After dodging the many demons sent after him, Izanagi reached the entrance of the underworld, Yomotsu Hirasaka. He set in place a large boulder as a barrier between the two worlds and got away unharmed. When the dreadful goddess reached the boulder, he said his farewell to her. Izanami said to the god, If you're going to treat me this way, I will kill 1,000 humans in your world each day. Izanagi regretfully accepted the bonds between them were severed, saying, Then I shall give life to 1,500 each day. Well, that is a doozy. The story seems to run contrary to the point of the game, that being creating bonds, but it also is a story about acceptance. Izanami has passed away, and Izanagi could not accept the truth. Even gods are not safe from the consequences of rejecting reality, and Izanagi saw the horror of Izanami. Luckily, he got out before it was too late. He was cursed, but he strived forward and made the best out of a bad situation. As you, you are also thrust into a horrible situation, but when faced with a difficult journey, you mustn't shy away. Izanagi's design is really nothing like his source material with his long black coat and ice skate boots. The persona has a metal helmet and a cod piece as well, which are um, nice touches. The only thing this design has in common with the historical depictions is the weapon which one could assume is a Naginata of sorts, with Izanagi often being depicted wielding one. Definitely an iconic persona. Yosuke Hanamura, Juness's golden boy. His persona is Jiraiya, not that one, of the Magician Arcana. Jiraiya is the protagonist of the Japanese folktale, The Tale of Gallant Jiraiya. Jiraiya is a ninja who uses shape-shifting magic to transform into a toad, he was the heir to the powerful Ogata clan and fell in love with a beautiful young woman named Tsunade, who mastered slug magic. Jiraiya's arch enemy though was his once follower known as Orochimaru, master of serpent magic. Wait a minute, this is sounding pretty familiar. The story itself goes over Jiraiya and Tsunade's quest to retrieve the Namikirimaru sword, to exercise the demonic influence over his once trusted friend and avenge the unjust slaying of their families. Jiraiya suffers much loss on his journey, even his long-lost sister, and confronts Orochimaru many times only to be subverted by his magic time and time again. Eventually though, he retrieves the mystical sword and with his influence transforms Orochimaru back into his human form and even suggests a pardon for him in the face of a very angry shogunate lord. A standout excerpt from the tale is the Chinese wise man's words, A toad is more powerful than a slug, a slug is more powerful than a snake, and a snake is more powerful than a toad. When all three meet, none can be the victor. Yosuke from the very beginning of the story struggles with his circumstances with his family and is inadvertently thrust into the middle of a horrible situation with his crush Saki Konishi being murdered. His quest may not be to retrieve a mystical sword, but the strive to solve the case pushes him to be the first to join the investigation team. Yosuke, despite his quirks, is by far the most responsible and committed member of the team, planning almost every outing and being the first to call you when there's something new airing on the Midnight Channel. The journey takes him through twists and turns, but when faced with what he feels is the true killer, Namatame, he sees red. With your help, he sees reason and chooses a more peaceful option, and by the end of the game, he fully resembles the tale of Jiraiya. Just less toads. The design of Jiraiya follows the same pattern as Izanagi, that is to say it's completely different from the source material. He wears a full white jumpsuit with camouflage patterns on the end of his pants and gloves. Golden shurikens are implanted on his hands and eyes as well as a golden, what seems to be a smile on his lapel. The red scarf flows nicely when the persona is summoned as well as gives more color to the persona. The eyes and hands of Jiraiya are reminiscent of the eyes and webbed feet of a toad though which is a nice touch. His shoe game is also on point. Hold up. Chie Satonaka, the carnivore karate champ. Her persona is Tomoe of the Chariot Arcana. Tomoe Gozen was a female samurai in the Genpei War circa 1180 to 1185. She commanded 300 samurai against a rival clan 2,000 warriors strong and was victorious. The enemy forces mounted though, and she was eventually overwhelmed while protecting her lord Yoshinaka. Yoshinaka, seeing the imminent defeat, told Tomoe to flee, as he would be ashamed to die with a woman. Tomoe's exploits have varied accounts, such as at the Battle of Owazu in 1184. She beheaded the Musashi clan general Hondo no Morishige and evaded capture to present his head to her master Yoshinaka, which dangled on the side of her horse like a witcher trophy. 
In fact, she was known for collecting severed heads, which on horseback would probably take considerable skill beheading everybody you meet. It is said in the tale of the Haike, Tomoe was especially beautiful, with white skin and long hair, and charming features. She was also a remarkably strong archer, and as a swordswoman, she was a warrior worth a thousand, ready to confront a demon or a god. Chie and Tomoe seem like a perfect match to me. From that description alone, it's obvious the similarities. Chie is not widely known for her intelligence, but she has all the qualities of a warrior. Training non-stop and being the first to put herself in harm's way for others. I mean, she fights physical manifestation of humanity's evil with nothing but her kicks. If that isn't bravery and skill, I don't know what is. Chie's rise to the occasion from being a regular high school student to shadow hunting machine mirrors Tomoe as well, considering Tomoe was just another of her master's female attendants before becoming a legendary warrior. Tomoe's design is an obvious homage to Bruce Lee's iconic yellow and black jumpsuit. Her waist is lined with armor reminiscent of the armor mounted samurai would wear during the war, and she carries a double-edged thousand-degree naginata. She has a large helmet with lipstick covering her face, with a yin-yang symbol emblazoned on the sides. An awesome design that reflects Tomoe and Chie's characters. Yukiko Amagi, the Giggling Heiress. Her persona is Konohana Sukuya of the Priestess Arcana. Konohana Sukuya is the goddess of Mount Fuji and all volcanoes, as well as the Blossom Princess with her symbol being the Sakura. Konohana Sukuya met Ninigi, the god responsible for rice and order in Japan, and they fell in love. On the night of their marriage, Sukuya became pregnant, causing suspicion from Ninigi. He accused his wife of infidelity, to which Sukuya was enraged and entered a doorless hut. She then set the hut on fire, proclaiming that her child would not be hurt if it was truly the offspring of Ninigi. Inside that hut, three sons were born, and she emerged unscathed. Not exactly mother of the year material, but maybe smoke inhalation doesn't affect gods. Yukiko's story doesn't share the same material as Sukuya, but the overall takeaway is the same. Be secure in yourself, and never lose sight of the truth. Sukuya was honest with herself, and instead of running away from a difficult situation, proved her innocence. Yukiko throughout the story has a hard time finding what she wants to accomplish in life, and coming to terms with her title as the next manager in line at the Amagi Inn also causes endless strife. Her castle shows she is incredibly fearful due to the weight of the situation, feeling smothered by the responsibility of having her life set out for her. Ultimately, she must face herself rather than an incredulous lover, but she does have a trial by fire. Konohana Sukuya's design is a nice homage to the official symbol of her source material. The Sakura flower and its signature white and pink colors are all over her design. The chains connected on both hands are lined with long pink Sakura petals with a flower on each bracelet. Her helmet is also lined with the Sakura chaplet. Sakura's clothing is reminiscent of Yukiko's uniform with the skirt and leggings and pink shirt with a white heart on the breast. It's fitting she's the goddess of volcanoes. Yukiko does go into explosive laughter. Kanji Tatsumi, the manliest seamstress. His persona is Take Mikazuchi of the Emperor Arcana. Take Mikazuchi is the deity of thunder in Japanese mythology. He was born after Izanagi cut off the head of the fire deity Kagatsuchi, who you might remember as Izanagi's son, and his blood stained the rocks and gave birth to several deities. In his most famous story, Take Mikazuchi was sent down from the realm of heaven to subjugate the earthly deities. Take Mikazuchi got there with Ame no Torifune, which is a boat and a god, and attempted to peacefully convince Oki Ninushi to relinquish the province to him, which he deferred the judgment to his child, Take Minakata. Take Minakata would not hand over the province to just anyone, and wanted to test Take Mikazuchi's strength, to which they had the first sumo match. This promptly resulted in Minakata's hands being crushed and turned into ice. Bruh. How a thunder god does that, I'm not sure. Don't worry though, Minakata relinquished the land and later became a guardian god. A pretty violent tale when relating to Kanji, but I think we can draw some parallels. To me, Kanji's story is all about understanding oneself. Not just his palace's obvious themes, but in terms of strength as well. Throughout Kanji's life, he's felt the need to prove himself to others and yet make no effort in making them understand. Understanding his true self. Take Mikazuchi's first inclination when he got to the middle country was not to commit wanton murder, but to peacefully take over. Only when forced did he resort to violence and even then did not kill. Kanji over the course of the game comes to understand the value of restraint and communication, 
as it could avoid many unwanted conflicts, though he still isn't the best with words. Take Mikazuchi's design is a large mechanical android looking automaton with a skeleton motif on the front. Wires connect the arms and it looks to be clad in armor with a tiny head. He also wields a comically sized lightning bolt as a weapon, I suppose to match the equally comical chair Kanji uses in battle. Electricity and robots are an understandable connection, but not much to do with the original Kami. He is a great drummer though, worthy of thunderous applause. Risei Kujikawa, the XX Idol Icon. Her persona is Himiko of the Lover's Arcana. Himiko was a shaman queen of the Yamatai Koku in the islands that would come to be known as Japan. From early sources, the people of the country agreed to elect a woman as their ruler, which was once ruled by a man for many decades. This rise to power ended the prior leader's civil unrest and warfare. Himiko focused on magic and sorcery, which at the time earned her great respect. She lived in a beautiful palace and had a thousand female attendants, but only one man who served as her means of communication outside said palace, as well as many guards, of course. Her reign was extremely strict and vigilant, leading to years of peace. Himiko also made great connections with the neighboring kingdom of Wei, which earned her the nickname Ruler of Wa, Friend of Wei. Upon her passing, the people of Yamatai Koku would not obey or respect the new king's laws, and would only be placated by one of Himiko's relatives taking the throne, who just so happened to be a 13-year-old girl. Himiko may also not even be a real historical figure, depending on which historical source you read. Risei's persona was most likely chosen to represent her backline support role for the investigation team. Himiko's incredibly popular yet reclusive role as leader of her people may also allude to Risei's idol persona and how she felt the real her was locked away from the outward appearance of Reset. Even her 13 year old as a successor is reminiscent of Risei and Kanamin. Over time though, Risei understood her importance. Whether behind a screen or communicating with people, much as Himiko's attendants must have come to love her as much as her subjects. Himiko as a persona has a unique space telescope or satellite-like design for her face, made of gold through the back of her head. She also wears long flowing white robes, much like shamans were known to wear in those ancient historical times. The persona also holds a gold seal, which is in reference to the golden seal with purple ribbon she received from the Kingdom of Wei as thanks for her loyalty and filial piety. An amazing design that complements the source material well. Teddy, the hollow suit filled with heart and heat. His persona is Kintoki Doji of the Star Arcana. Kintoki Doji is the name the legendary figure Kintaro took once he reached adulthood. Also known as the Golden Boy, he was a Japanese folk hero and man of superhuman strength raised by a mountain witch. Exact sources of Kintaro's birth are hard to come by, but what all accounts share is that even as a toddler he had endless stamina, incredible strength, and only wore a bib with the kanji for gold written on it hence the nickname Golden Boy. Kintaro was friend to all animals in his home mountain, and was even said to be able to communicate with them. After a life of having fun with animals, helping the local woodcutters, and smashing Oni into dust, he ran into the samurai Minamoto no Yorimitsu after his passing through the area of Mount Kintoki. Yorimitsu was so impressed with Kintaro's enormous strength that he took him as one of his personal retainers to live in Kyoto. There, he changed his name to Kintoki Doji and studied martial arts to eventually become the chief of Yorimitsu's four braves, known far and wide for his strength and martial prowess. Eventually, he came back to the mountain and brought his mom back to live with him in Kyoto as well. What a nice guy. Teddy shares many parallels to the story of Kintoki Doji. He lived in a land not inhabited by many, then acclimated to a new land, helping those in need as he went. Despite having strange powers and an alien form, Teddy is integral to the plot of Persona 4, and it all kicks off once he deems the protagonist as his sensei, making you his Yorimitsu. Teddy's just lacking the superhuman strength part. Kintoki's Persona design is that of a red spherical metal ball lined with gold, in reference to his common symbol of a red bib with the kanji for gold written on it. The center of his body looks like a vault as well, possibly alluding to his transformation to another form through the game. The missile is often something that confuses people, but this is most likely in reference to Kintoki Doji's iconic tomahawk, which he uses as a tool to help woodcutters and a weapon for fighting Oni. In his persona, it's depicted as a tomahawk missile. The blue cape is an additional flair, but may be a slight reference to the tale of the young Kitaro fighting a giant carp. Maybe that's a stretch though. Overall, a nice design, with more than meets the eye. 
Naoto's persona is Sukuna Hikona, Japanese dwarf deity of healing, brewing sake, and knowledge. His name roughly translates to small lord of renown. His full name is Sukuna Hikona no Kami. And he's often associated with hot springs and paired with Okuninushi, whom he helped in building the world and formulating protections against diseases and wild animals. He first arrived in Izumo in a small boat of bark and clad in goose skins, where he, after being picked up by Okuninushi, promptly bit him on the cheek. However, they quickly became friends. He died after climbing onto a millet stalk that rebounded and threw him into the Tokoyo no Kuni, the land of eternity. While on the surface this does not seem to have much to do with Naoto as a character, there are quite a few similarities. For one, him biting Okuninushi's hand as it were only to become his best friend could be seen in the same way as Naoto's initial adversity towards the investigation team, only to open up to them later on. His title as Small Lord of Renown can also be seen as a reflection of Naoto's insecurity towards his size, and much like Tsukahinoka helped Okuninushi in protecting people against the evil diseases, so does Naoto help the cast help people against the murderers. The persona itself, however, doesn't make nearly as much sense, at least not design-wise taking on the form of a common Rider inspired butterfly using some sort of lightsaber. He wears a blue suit with big yellow buttons quite reminiscent of Detective Conan, just with a yellow cravat instead of a red fly, which fits with Naoto's character. He also wears black and white striped pants and what looks like hiking shoes, which may be in reference to him being a dwarf in folklore. On top of that, he can also not learn any healing magic, which is pretty weird considering that he's a deity of healing. Joker Joker's starting persona is Arsène. Arsène is based off the fictional gentleman burglar Arsène Lupin. Arsène is a character created by French author Maurice Leblanc. Sound familiar? In 1905, published in the magazine Je Sais Tout. Throughout his depictions, Arsène is shown as a man on the side of good, operating on the wrong side of the law. The character itself is a con man Robin Hood type figure that steals from the rich and benefits the poor. While he stands alone in some publications, he is also amused to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's character, Sherlock Holmes. Arsène is non-violent when dealing with the law enforcement, but often pranks and misdirects them, a perfect counterpart to Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Lupin is an obvious connection to Joker and the gentleman thief archetype. They even talk about it in the game. Joker is the main character, so a lot of his actions will be determined by you, but there are some constants I can tie back to. The idea of changing the world with less than legal means, and a tendency to burglarize those conveying unjust power, fits both these characters to a T. The design of Arsène is obviously not very true to the source material, considering Arsène was meant to be a normal man, but is interesting nonetheless. The clothing worn by the persona is reminiscent of depictions of Arsène with the top hat, black suit and white ruffles, as well as the red overcoat and waist-high red boots being a little less true to Lupin. The other more demonic attributes of his design, such as the horns and black wings, are most likely to segue nicely into his awakened state, Satanayo. Ryuji Sakamoto, everyone's favorite blonde boy bro. His persona is Captain Kidd. Captain Kidd, also known as William Kidd, was a Scottish-born privateer and pirate. William Kidd was a member of an English-French pirate crew sailing the Caribbean and mutinied against his captain to become the leader. Once in control of a ship now named the Blessed William, a bit arrogant, huh? He sailed to the island of Nevis to protect it from the French and because he knew the governor there. Once there, they were promptly told they would not be paid for their defensive services, but that their payment would come from the French. Wink wink. Captain Kidd then spent a good portion of his life looting French settlements and ships. After a good long while of very pirate-like behavior, his crew became more than a little savage. There were accounts of torture, but Captain Kidd was furious at his crew and forced him to return most of the stolen goods after he found out. Later, after accidentally sacking a neutral ship, the Royal Navy was to subject the crew to impressment, which is an old-timey way of saying drafting them into the army. Rather than let them do that, however, Captain Kidd escaped with his crew late into the night and resumed his pirate-like behavior, but this time, not fooling anybody. Ryuji Sakamoto is written to have a good amount of similarities to this historical figure in personality and general demeanor. Both characters display outwardly aggressive mannerisms and are branded by what people perceive them as. For Ryuji, he's branded a delinquent despite his very caring nature and a willingness to put himself in harm's way to protect those he cares for, and Captain Kidd branded as a pirate despite displaying consistent morality and belief in helping his country. Prior to Captain Kidd's execution, he was prompted to name his accomplices and implicate them, but he refused, in spite of their not intervening on his behalf. This sentiment mirrors a quote that Ryuji says, Someone treating you like dirt doesn't give you the right to do the same to them. 
Captain Kidd's design is pretty much what you'd expect from a personified historical figure. Standard black trousers and boots with a blue privateer's coat. His chest is inlaid with two scimitars attached to chained anchors and a pirate captain's hat with a Jolly Roger motif rests upon his eye patch wearing skull head. Kidd's cannon arm, crimson cape, and mini flying ship I find particularly charming as well. I'd recommend stealing his look. Morgana, the schedule keeping cat. His persona is Zorro. Yes, THE Zorro, fictional character created by Johnston McCulley in 1919. Set in the Spanish occupation of the municipality of Los Angeles around the time of 1769 to 1821. A masked vigilante defending commoners and indigenous people of California against the corrupt rulers and general villainy. Often depicted in all black attire and a signature rapier, Zorro's true identity is Don Diego de la Vega, son of Alejandro de la Vega a wealthy landowner in California, and his mother having passed away in his earlier years. Diego learned his swordsmanship in Spain while at university, but was called back to California by his father to learn about his home falling into the hands of a tyrannical dictator. Upon learning this revelation, Zorro was born. Diego lives in a large estate, with many secret passages and even a cave which serves as a base of operations and a hiding place for his favorite horse, Tornado. In Diego's non-Zorro activities, he hides his martial skill by pretending to be a coward. With that brief description alone, there can be many ties back to Morgana. First appearing as a masked bipedal cat, whose first instinct is to help those unfortunate enough to have found themselves in Kamoshida's torture castle. While in the real world, he appears to be an average house cat, in the metaverse, he is a confident swordsman. The theme of rebellion is obviously mirrored by Zoro, and Morgana trying to find his homeland can be related to Diego's aim of regaining his homeland from tyranny. Also, the fact that Zoro's favorite horse is named Tornado might be why Morgana uses wind magic in the game. Zoro's design in Persona 5, aside from the proportions, is the most realistic portrayal of the source material in the game. Clad in leather pants, cape, riding boots, and blouse, with leather gloves and a flat-brimmed hat also serving as Zoro's signature mask. His waist is adorned by an ornate leather Z belt buckle. Yes, I'm Canadian, so I say Z most likely in reference to the fact that Zoro would carve the letter Z into his fallen enemies' bodies with his rapier as a mark of his work. On to Kamaki, a lover's arcana favorite. Her persona is Carmen. Carmen is a novella written by Prosper Merime, with the titular Carmen as the main character written in 1845. Carmen is a textbook example of a femme fatale, using her beauty to take advantage of those foolish enough to trust her. In the story, Jose Lizara Bengao, I think that's how you say it, was working as a guard in a cigar factory when he met a worker there named Carmen. Jose found her carving X's into another worker's face after a fight and arrested her only to release her after being sweet-talked by Carmen. Jose's superiors found out about this and subsequently arrested and demoted him. After his release, Carmen came to reward him with a few nights of bliss. I think you know what that means. From then on, Jose was head over heels for Carmen, and allowed her band of smugglers to pass by his guard post unhindered. One day though, Jose went looking for Carmen, and while in her home, she entered with his very own lieutenant. He didn't take that very well, and provoked a fight that ended in the lieutenant's death. Jose then fled with Carmen's band of outlaws. From spending so much time with the band, he slowly realized Carmen would use her beauty to entice anyone for the benefit of her band, and that she was married. Jose, once again, mad with jealousy, stabbed Carmen's husband to death and took her as his wife. Now, as I'm sure you all know, you can't solve all your problems with wanted murder, so Carmen told him that she loved him less than before and that murdering everyone she liked wasn't very cool. Jose begged her to flee with him and start an honest life, but she said she knew he was fated to kill her and that Carmen will always be free. Then, in typical Jose fashion, he stabbed her to death too. Wow, pretty heavy stuff and not too similar to Persona 5 on the surface, but let's try to tie it back. Carmen was most likely chosen to represent Ahn due to her looks being one of her most defining features. Ahn struggles to come to terms with the fact that many people will only see her as a pretty face, but never loses conviction in her goals as a phantom thief. For the entirety of Persona 5, she holds great passion for the big picture of the phantom thieves and helping the world is her number one priority. In the novella, Carmen does anything necessary to maintain the safety of her criminal band, as well as thinking far into the future and using the knowledge beneath her outward beauty. Carmen, depicted in the game, wears a very low-cut frilly red dress reminiscent of Spanish and Romani design. Hearts dot her corset and thigh-high high heel shoes with a rose belt connecting her two servants by their thorny stem. 
A panther mask covers her face, and she is shown smoking a cigar in reference to where Jose first met her in the cigar factory in the novella. What's up everyone, David here and I'm here today recording a clip for my boy Tony for you who asked me to submit a clip actually of me describing and explaining who's my favorite Persona 5 character and why and what's his story. And today I chose to talk about Yusuke because he's definitely one of the more interesting characters in Persona 5 in my opinion. So today I am taking a few minutes to talk about Yusuke Kitagawa and his persona Goemon. So if you don't know, Yusuke is the funny guy in Persona 5. Hey, uh, since it's just us guys in here, let me ask you. Girls dancing. Pretty hot, right? Don't tell me. Have you been leering at Futaba during her routines? The one who is a bit savage. That's enough. You're disgracing your yukata. You should be more aware of your womanhood. The one who is awkward at times. Yeah, this one. Apologies, but I was entranced. The moment I set eyes on this distinct shape, I was in love. This Yosuke. <laughs> His persona is definitely my favorite one from Persona 5, it's Goemon. And actually, if you don't know, Goemon is a very interesting figure from Japanese history. Hishikawa Goemon was initially interpreted very differently from a story to another. Some said he was born a samurai and others said that he was only a thief. But the most common thing that we hear from him in the books is that he's a courageous man who lived a life of anger and greed. Some even call him the Japanese Robin Hood and the reason for that is actually very interesting and impressive in my opinion. He was known for stealing from the rich people in town and giving back what he stole to the poor. In 1973, the man lost both his parents to the ends of a party of the Japanese government, Ashikaga Shogunate. Excuse my pronunciation. Ashiga Shogunate is the leading military institution during the Muromachi period of Japanese history. In other words, from 1336 to 1573. All of that happened when he was only 15 years old. Ishikawa Goemon lived his whole life training martial arts and ninjutsu and looking for revenge. It was no easy tasks. It's with the assistance of Momochi Sandayu, the man who adopted him, that he was able to gain a lot of skills as a martial art artist. Once he mastered those skills, he finally did it. He tried to kill a Japanese lord who goes by the name of Toyotomi Hideyoshi. You heard me right, he tried. Because on this day, Goemon failed and he was sentenced to death, but not any normal death. He was dropped with his own son in a boiling chaldron. The last thing that this remarkable hero did before dying is that he held his son in the air in the boiling chaldron. This is probably the most common picture uh, and painting that we can see of him while researching on him online. It's probably his most iconic mom moment of his life, his death holding his son in the air. So kind of a sad story, but I still think it was extremely unique and interesting. Now in Persona 5, Yusuke Kitagawa unveils his persona, Goemon, when he finds out the truth about his master and tutor, Madarame. The first thing that hits with the lore behind Goemon and Yusuke's story is the desire for revenge and the extremely high level of anger in regards to the man who was supposed to be his model. Goemon's design in the game is by far my favorite but because of how unique he looks, plus his face, or more precisely the paintings on his face, references his Yukiyo-hi painting since Yusuke's character was inspired by a Japanese painter named Utamaro Kitagawa, who was also a Nuki Yohi painter. And Yuki Hohi is actually a style of heart that you're, you've been seeing since the beginning of this video. It's Japanese paintings. So, yes, there's the Robin Hood, Japanese Robin Hood reference with Goemon, but there's also the paintings on his face that most people don't know, then I thought was super interesting. That's it for my clip. I hope that it gave you a good idea of who's Yusuke Kitagawa and why he's my favorite character, and also the unfortunate story of. Ishikawa Goemon, his persona. Makoto Nijima, the book smart badass. Her persona is Johanna. Johanna is based off Johannes Angelicus, a legendary woman who disguised herself as a man and rose through the ranks of the Catholic Church to eventually become the Pope. Which is something that may or may not have actually happened. Either way, there are many accounts of Joan's story, but for the purpose of this video, I will be taking the source of the Chronicum Pontificum e Imperatorum by Martin Opava. In this account, Joan went by the name of John after being led to Athens dressed as a man by her lover. 
In Athens, she spent her time learning the branches of knowledge until she had no equal, and after her schooling she went to Rome where she taught liberal arts and even had some great masters come to see her speak. Joan's reputation began to precede her, and after some time, she was chosen to become the Pope. Unfortunately, while she was the Pope, Joan became pregnant and gave birth during a procession, which then led to her death. The street Joan perished in was later known as the Shunned Street, and it is said that is where she was buried. Joan was wiped from the papacy's historical records, and the Lord Pope turns aside his head every time he passes the street. While not particularly a religious figure, there are many parallels one could draw to Makoto. Makoto, while being the student president, is very unpopular and has very little self-worth. Only after donning her persona's mask does she really begin to fight for what she believes in. Becoming a phantom thief allows her highly analytical mind to flourish as she takes a pseudo-leadership position in the battles. She views the phantom thieves as a tool to dispense justice, and isn't above a little subterfuge in enabling her to do what is right. Johanna, as depicted in the game, is a motorcycle. Mm, very unique. Johanna is a sleek metallic motorcycle with a woman's face on the front. I believe they went with this design to represent Pope Joan's inability to show much of herself aside from her face, so as not to reveal her true identity. The face's more or less androgynous features and peaceful look could somewhat give off a holy, almost angelic vibe as well. Also, Pope Joan is a very common character used to depict the Priestess Tarot card, which is Makoto's specific arcana. Futaba Sakura, Hermit Savant. Her persona is Necronomicon. The Necronomicon is an outlier, as it is not one particular historical or mythological figure, but the magical grimoire Book of the Dead. The Necronomicon was mentioned in the short story The Hound, written by H.P. Lovecraft in 1922, but the exact origins of the Necronomicon are unknown. For the sake of this video, I will be using the Lovecraft mythos. The Necronomicon, as accounted in the posthumously released book, History of the Necronomicon, was originally called Al-Azif, an Arabic word Lovecraft defined as the nocturnal sound, the howling of demons. Very SMT. The contents of the book are mostly unknown, but it can be extrapolated that it holds ancient cosmic knowledge that has the potential to drive those who read it mad, in true Lovecraft fashion. The Necronomicon is also translated as the Book of the Dead, and could possibly be a necromantic tome used to communicate with the deceased. There is so much to say about the Necronomicon, the Lovecraft mythos runs deep, but I will leave it at that for now and try to relate it back to Futaba. When you first meet Futaba, she is in a sorry state, suffering from suicidal depression and even hallucinations. She sees herself as mentally dead, and deserving of it as well. Her palace is an Egyptian pyramid filled with ancient chambers with names like Chamber of Regret and Chamber of Guilt. Futaba, in her delusions, does nothing but fill her mind with knowledge, while not of the ancient forbidden kind, definitely esoteric to many. The famous rhyming couplet attributed to the author of the Necronomicon states, That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. Through the strange power of the phantom thieves, Futaba's yearning for death may die. Somewhat ironically, Futaba can only use the vast knowledge she acquired while suffering from this psychosis after her will to live is rekindled. The Necronomicon in the game is represented by a UFO which picks up Futaba with very Cthulhu-like tentacles in reference to Lovecraft. The outside is adorned with green markings with some battery and smartphone motifs and a gargoyle statue on the top. The inside of the Necronomicon is an empty abyss Futaba floats in with words and numbers flying by only she can understand. A UFO is fitting for what can be seen as alien knowledge. Very cool. Haru Okumura, the Sadistic Empress. Her persona is Milady. Milady is in reference to Milady de Winter, a fictional character in Alexandre Dumas' book The Three Musketeers. Milady is described in the book as being a tall, fair-haired, beautiful woman with a voice that can bewitch anyone. Under the exterior is an intelligent French spy passing as a native Englishwoman, remorseless in her actions and ruthlessly accomplishes her goals. As a nun at the age of 16, Milady seduced a priest to steal the church's sacred vessels to finance a new life elsewhere in the country. They were then caught and sentenced to death, but Milady seduced the jailer's son to escape. The executioner happened to be the priest's brother and blamed Milady for leading his brother to criminality. He branded her with the same fleur-de-lis symbol given to criminals at the time. The priest afterward escaped as well and fled with Milady to a small town. The owner of the land then became captivated by her beauty and married her, giving her his wealth and title. 
One day, while she was out hunting with her husband, Milady falls off her horse and faints. Her husband, the landowner, cuts away her clothes so she can breathe, only to discover the convict's brand and filled with rage has her hanged from a tree. The landowner searches for Milady's brother who had married them, but he is nowhere to be found, not knowing that the brother and Milady were the same person. Milady somehow survives her hanging and flees to Paris, where she marries into English nobility and the husband mysteriously dies shortly after the marriage. Throughout the book, the musketeers mount evidence against Lady de Winter, leading to her eventual execution. There are similarities between Milady and Carmen, in both being femme fatales manipulating those around them for personal gain. Milady, after being branded, is forced to obfuscate the truth of her origins and survive by any means. Haru can be seen throughout the game being forced into situations where she loses her sense of self. Her trust issues are worthy of note, as she has no friends up to that point in the story, solely relying on others to make decisions for her. Once she awakens to her powers though, she casts aside being a subservient puppet, and afterwards shows signs of being quite sadistic in her approach to people's liberation, showing Milady really is a better fit for Haru than Carmen as a femme fatale. Maybe if Haru was to marry her fiancé, he would turn up mysteriously dead as well. <laughs> Milady is an invisible figure wearing a late Baroque-style pink and black dress with sleeves to her elbows and long pink gloves covering her hands. The base of the dress is emblazoned with a golden floral pattern and a pair of lips in the center of the seam right below a dagger. Milady is also holding a black fur-lined fan and a pink mask being the only thing that's representing her face, with yellow eyes reminiscent of the shadow world. When attacking, the seam on her dress opens, revealing cannons behind that golden mouth. Symbolism is pretty clear on that one. Her invisibility conveys the common occurrence of Milady assuming different identities. Overall, a great design. Goro Akechi, the Psycho Detective. Now, spoiler warning, I won't be talking about Robin Hood for this one. His true persona is Loki. Loki is a Norse trickster god, sometimes helping the other gods and sometimes acting maliciously towards them. He can shapeshift into any creature, which he uses to his advantage in orchestrating convoluted schemes for or against the wishes of his kin. Loki is the father of Hel, goddess of the underworld, Fenrir, wolf of Ragnarok, Jormungandr, the world serpent, and even mother of Slepnir, the eight-legged horse. Yeah, shapeshifting is weird. In the poetic Edda, there are many stories involving Loki, but I'll share one I find particularly interesting. Loki and the other gods are drinking together, and Loki is insulting the guests there. The other guests are praising the host's servers, and Loki can't stand hearing it, kills one of them out of anger, only to be driven out by the other gods into the woods. Loki comes out of the woods and meets Eldir, and demands to know what they're talking about back inside of the party. Eldir says they're talking about weapons and war, you know, typical Norse stuff, and some not-so-friendly things about Loki. He then devises a plan to mix their mead with malice, turning them against each other just as much as Loki. This ends up getting Loki into a lot of trouble as he enters back into the party, but not after chewing out almost every single god there. While Loki was a god in Norse mythology, his father was a giant, and Loki was the god's ultimate undoing. Goro Akechi is akin to Loki in many ways. Loki and Akechi are both cursed children of evil fathers. Akechi is an eccentric, deceitful man using any means necessary to appear competent and worthy of praise. Akechi and Joker's relationship even somewhat mirrors Loki and Thor's relationship with the enviousness of the circumstances of their birth. The use of multiple personas in reality as well as in the palaces is also reminiscent of Loki's frequent shapeshifting to suit his needs. Akechi uses cloak and dagger tactics to enact a plan decades in the making, but thankfully he is thwarted by the main cast and redeemed. Let's just hope there's no Ragnarok incoming for Persona 5's cast. Loki's design in Persona 5 is very unique, nothing like the usual artistic depictions of Loki. He has a sleek, monochrome pattern across his body with curved horns and hooves, most likely in reference to his shape-shifting nature. Loki also has red braids that taper off into a fire-like pattern, referencing Loki's frequently being attributed to a god of fire. A simple yet very expressive design. Last but not least, Sumere, the elegant introvert. Her persona is Sendrilan. Cendrillon is the French translation of Cinderella and the most famous depiction of the old European folktale of the same name, the version we all know and love published in 1697 by Charles Perrault, though the tale is said to be much older than that being passed down by oral tradition. 
Now I'm sure you all know the story of Cinderella, but in case you don't, I'll summarize it. Cinderella is a kind and beautiful young woman forced to be a maid for her oppressive stepmother and cruel stepsisters. Word is eventually received that the kingdom's prince is holding a ball to search for a bride. But Cinderella's family forbids her from attending as she is nothing but a maid. Eventually, a fairy godmother appears and grants Cinderella's wish of attending the ball by loaning her a dress only until midnight. Come the night of the ball, the prince is smitten with her, but she is forced to return home before her clothes disappear, but leaves behind one glass slipper, which is something maids have, I guess. The prince finds the slipper and somewhat obsessively forces every woman he sees to try it on, probably making them very uncomfortable in the process. But then he eventually finds Cinderella. The prince marries her and they live happily ever after. So sweet it almost makes you sick. Now for Sumire, she's a very polite and easily flustered girl. While she is shy in conversation, she is an extremely capable gymnast. And like Cinderella, there is an aspect of familial strain in Sumire's life with her sister and father. She suffers from a severe inferiority complex, which after her sister's passing is compounded with survivor's guilt. Both characters have poor opinions of themselves despite their obviously positive attributes. Sumire doesn't have to get her Prince Charming in the end, as her glass slipper was the Phantom Thieves outfit leading to her self-betterment. What if the real Prince Charming was the friends we made along the way? Cendralon's design has an obvious glass motif in reference to the glass slipper, with a flowing white cape most likely symbolizing the dress. Her hair is tied up in buns, akin to the depiction of Cinderella in the Disney film, tied up with a blue bow more reminiscent of her time as a maid. The gold, inset with blue glass on her waist, gives a more royal castle-like feel. A simple yet pleasant design. Starting with Sophia's persona, Pythos of No Arcana. Pythos is less of a mythological figure or folklore legend, but rather a metaphor. Pythos were large jars in the Neolithic era of 10,000 BC to 4,500 BC. These jars were used for all manner of storage and were ubiquitous at the time. So common, in fact, that Pandora's box, an ancient Greek story of unleashing all the world's sickness and death, was originally a pythos and only mistranslated as a box. I'll save the explanation of that tale for later in the video. As for the relation to Sophia, a pythos is merely a container, one that can hold any number of things. Sophia is an AI found in the first jail of the game, and her memory was wiped. Her prime directive is to become humanity's companion and fill her empty memories with knowledge of the human heart. Over the course of the game, she asks the Phantom Thieves, and Joker specifically, many questions relating to human expressions and has an endless curiosity for the emotions of humans. Every jail's completion is marked with a question by Sophia, and a difficult one at that, relating to the human condition. The answers given to her fill up the empty vessel that ultimately becomes Sophia. As for the design, it's fairly standard. True to her persona's name, she has four floating vessels or pythos carrying the abilities she uses in lieu of a true persona. The engravings on the persona seem to be inane, but are most likely meant to represent the engravings commonly found on Pythos within the Mediterranean at the time of their usage. An interesting pseudo-persona. Zenkichi Hasegawa, the gunslinging family man. His persona is Valjean, of the Apostle Arcana. Jean Valjean is the protagonist of Victor Hugo's famous novel Les Miserables, released in 1862. The story focuses on Valjean's struggle to survive after spending years in prison. He is refused shelter by all except a bishop by the name of Monseigneur Millien. Valjean uses this chance to steal silverware from the man, and is caught soon after. Upon the police's capture of Valjean, Miriel claims the silverware was a gift, and makes Valjean promise to use the silverware to become an honest man. The bishop claimed to have purchased his soul, withdrawing it from evil and delivering it to God. Valjean does just that after his encounter with the bishop, after just one more theft, and under the new name of M. Madeleine opens a factory in Montreuil and brings prosperity to the town. Not far away, a woman named Fantine leaves her illegitimate child with an innkeeper and his wife on her way to her hometown of Montreuil for work. Fantine finds a job in Madeleine's factory, but is later fired, and with growing debts she is accruing, turns to prostitution. After some time, she is arrested. Only after Madeleine's intervention is she released. Fantine falls ill shortly after, and Madeleine promises to deliver her child to her before she dies. At the same time, he hears that someone was arrested under the name Jean Valjean, and he becomes conflicted. Remember that last theft he did? Madeleine decides to confess his crimes and exonerate the accused man in a grand display, which results in his imprisonment again. 
Back with the name Jean Valjean, he is sent to a prison camp by the docks, but manages to escape after saving one of the dock workers' lives who fell overboard under the guise of him drowning. He then makes it his mission to save Fantine's child and deliver her to safety. That's all I'll go over with the summary of the book, but it is a good read, and there's definitely more to it than that. Zenkichi and Jean share many qualities, such as their straying from the path of truth and their true sense of justice in the face of adversity. Zenkichi spent the two years following his wife Aoi's death by first attempting to hold Owada culpable, but after threats to his daughter's life, he was forced to back down. After losing his driving force and gaining the disdain of his daughter, Zenkichi buried himself in his work in hopes that one day it would get better. His daughter's mortal danger was the only thing to snap him out of his self-hating slump and finally do what's right for himself and for the world. Jean and Zenkichi, after facing hardship, receded in life, and only after the chance to save another's life did they rise to the occasion and break free from themselves. Maybe part of the reason why I like this guy so much is because he reminds me of Ryotaro Dojima. Hmm. Valjean's design is that of a well-dressed French man with arms, legs, chest, and head covered in chains and cages, signifying the inciting factor of his incarceration. He wears knee-high boots and carries a revolver, most likely similar to the weapons French policemen would carry at the time. A striking design for a persona, and uniquely sets itself apart from the others. Lastly, Sophia's true persona, Pandora of the Hope Arcana. Pandora was breathed into existence by Hephaestus, Greek god of fire, and with the help of the other gods, received blessings from all of them to make her extraordinary. Most importantly for this story was Zeus's gift, those being the trait of curiosity and a heavy pythos, ornately crafted and the contents of which were not for mortal eyes. On Earth, Pandora fell in love with the Titan Epimetheus, brother of Prometheus, who was tasked with crafting the landscapes of the world. Over Pandora's life, the contents of the box weighed heavily on her thanks to Zeus's trait. Over time, the mystery became too much to bear and she justified her opening of the pythos by only taking a small peek and sealing it forever. Such was the draw of her curiosity. After just the first cracking of the lid, however, the contents spilled out. Horrific spirits spewed forth and circled around Pandora. Zeus had used this pythos as a vessel to store all the evils and forces of suffering in the world, and in truth, was expected to be opened. When the geyser of terror ceased, she put back the lid and sat. In the silence, she heard more from the pythos, not the wailing of curses, but a soft murmur. When Pandora opened the pythos again, a soft ray of light flew out and spread across the earth and set her mind at ease. The last contents of the pythos was hope. The correlation between Pandora's box and a self-learning AI are unmistakable, and fit very nicely with the themes of Persona. So well, in fact, that this isn't the first time Pandora was used as a prominent figure in the games. <coughs> Sophia, from even the little I spoke of her previously, is nothing but curious. Her ever-prevalent fascination with the human heart and psyche were baked into her code by Ichinose. Inquiry into the human heart resulted in nothing but suffering for Ichinose, and thus leads to the inciting events of Persona 5 Strikers being Emma. That same curiosity, though, leads to the creation of Sophia, which ends up enduring longer and having far more of an effect on the world than any malevolent AI could hope to do. Sophia is the hope at the bottom of the Pythos, which is even somewhat foreshadowed by you finding her in the deepest part of the first jail, the metaphorical bottom of the game's towering narrative. The design of Pandora is that of all four of Sophia's Pythos is coming together in opening revealing a scantily clad woman. Pandora has the same thigh-high socks and hot pants as Sophia, with an <clears throat> revealing top connected to full arm gloves. Pandora's hands and feet are segmented with no digits as floating abstract blocks, possibly alluding to her husband's brother Prometheus's job creating the first early humans. Her head is a block with the same intricate engravings as the pythos covering her eyes, the same as the curiosity that blinded her to the warnings of Zeus. I was curious and very surprised at this persona's design. Pandora is a great fit. That covers every party member's starting persona in each persona game. Let me know which game, along with what persona and party member duo were your favorites in the comments down below. While you're down there, leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Big thanks to every guest who is along for the journey to cover this massive topic over such a long period of time. This series was one of the first I ever started on my channel and I loved talking about these games. Because it was started so early though, you may have noticed some differences in voiceover since the videos came out so far apart, so sorry for that. Special thanks to Anton, Big T, Frankie Stoned, Jim Taylor, Just a Middleman, Konyuna, Matt M, Mr. Eight Eyes, The Digital Dutchman, Video Gamer 75, The Toaster Messiah, and many more for supporting the channel on Patreon. If you'd like to support, check the link in the description below.
I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next Tony For You. Have a good one.